Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, uh, Vice President uh, Pete Lesher to do the prayer, and then we're going to follow that by the Pledge of Allegiance on the flag. Most gracious God, we give you thanks for the many different people of Talbot County. Teach us to look upon one another as neighbors and to be guided by your law that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to see the humanity in one another, to respect one another so that we may learn to live together in peace. Guide us as public servants to make decisions with fairness and justice for the people of Talbot County. Amen. 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 Join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Good job. Let's start off with the uh, agenda. The, the agenda. Council has an agenda of December 14th for us. Um, are there any um, additions, deletions, or corrections to the agenda? Council President, I would like to amend the agenda to delete the minutes from November 23rd as they are not included in the Granicus package at this time for us to review. Okay, sounds good. Can I get a second? No, it's second. Okay, we've got a motion to second by the Secretary. Could you call the vote? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. Gavilio? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pass? All right. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to, um, we'll move on to uh, disbursements uh, for, for uh, November 30th, uh, December 7th, and December 14th. Um, Council has had a chance to review the disbursements of the, the, the 30th, the 7th, and the 14th. Are there any additions? Um, Relations or corrections uh, to these disbursements. Hearing none, um, the chair moves that the disbursements be um, accepted in unanimous consent. Okay, let's uh, introduction of the number resolution. Um, council, uh, Madam Secretary, could you read the resolution, please? A resolution to amend the Talbot County Comprehensive Water and Sewer Plan regarding the connection of Phase 1, Section 1 of the Lakeside Project to the existing trap wastewater system. Okay. All right, we have a, uh, a, a so we, so uh, do we have, uh, Mr. Thomas, could you uh, comment on this resolution, please? Uh, yes, Mr. President. Yeah. So, so this was prepared at Councilmember Price's request. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it proposes to amend the comprehensive water and sewer plan in, in three respects. Uh, one, it would require that any new connections to the existing uh, town wastewater system from, from the lakeside phase one uh, are subject to that to the existing system not having any outstanding MDE enforcement actions, consent orders or violations. Uh, it also provides that no portion of the start of phase may be connected to the existing system more than 18 months after final approval. If this, this were to be adopted by the council and go on to MDE, so 18 months from final approval by MDE. Mm -hmm. um, and third, within 18 months from the final issuance of all required permits and approvals for the new Lakeside wastewater treatment plant, all wastewater <coughs> from that startup phase uh, being treated by the existing system would have to be redirected to the new system. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, okay, council, uh, could we please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to introduce this? Uh, resolution. That's by Mr. Callahan, myself, and Mrs. Price. Can we have a normally we don't have a lot of discussion, but can I give a little bit of the background and especially in light of some of the information that we've gotten? Sure. Is that okay? Um, <clears throat> so this was read in essence last month. Uh, the very few changes to what um, was read as a resolution that didn't get introduced because we had to wait because um, we can only do introductions to the comprehensive water and sewer plan four times a year which is why we had to wait on this one um, the language in here is really what the developer and trap has uh, represented to us over the years um, as far as um, them saying that 
that would take them 12 to 18 months um, to build that uh, spray irrigation wastewater treatment plants, you know, uh, at such time if and when MDE issues that permit. Um, and what this does is instead of them just being able to stay connected to this plant for an infinite number of, you know, months, years, whatever, it, it holds them accountable to um, what they have said verbally to us as far as it wouldn't take them more and they would be on a side-by-side -side track, that it would be temporary in nature, it, you know, it's a startup start -up phase. Um, and th this homes wouldn't be able to stay on there um, any longer than that you know, period of time. Um, and what I'll say is, you know, we've had a lot of other new information and we're about to have a, you know, a, you know, a continuance of the public hearing, but I'm sure most people here, um, you know, heard some of the information last night. Um, this may or may not be everything. This, in my opinion, is some protections um, environmentally that it limits, um, how many can be connected and for how long. Um, we have additional information that we're going to consider and we're going to also continue to hear from you all this evening. Um, but this at least would afford us some protections environmentally. Um, and uh, I guess that's, that's pretty much it on that. I mean, it's not, it may not be the be all and end all, but I'd rather have some, some protections in place rather than nothing especially given, you know, a lot of new information that the council is hearing and considering, and we're looking forward to hearing the rest of the public hearing from you all this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryce. Any other the council? Okay. Okay. Um, so, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the resolution number and the, the hearing and the date and time, please? This will be known as resolution number 313, and the public hearing will be held on Tuesday, January 11th at 6.30 p.m. Okay, thank you. Okay. January 11th. So does that give the both the Planning Commission and the Public Works Advisory Board an opportunity? Or I believe so. Is there any reason why we should... Um, do this on the second meeting in January just to make sure all of that happens. Council Member Price, uh, our meeting is on January 5th. The advertisement for that goes out this Thursday. We do have time to get on the agenda. Okay. I know we had talked about possibly doing this public hearing on the second meeting in January, just because of we're receiving so much new information. No, no, no. I mean, you guys still do your thing in January. I, I would, because of all so much volumes of information coming out about this project in general, I would like to have the opportunity to have the additional two weeks in case we need to make any type of amendments to this based on information that we receive. Um, so the third week in January is the 25th. Yeah. The 25th. The second uh, meeting. Second meeting. Correct. Uh, yeah. I, I, I would support that. Okay. Okay, great. The 25th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Next, we're getting ready to start the continuation of the public hearing um, on, on number 308. Madam Secretary, if you leave the resolution, please. Right. Can we go over it? It's not 5 6 30 yet, Chuck. Oh. oh. All right. I, want to start going off. Okay. I guess we can do the do next we, introduction. Um, can we do the next introduction of number resolution? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll wait on the public here. Yeah, we'll have to do kind of manager. Uh, so let's, let's move on to the introduction of, of number resolution. Um, so, Madam Secretary, could you read that, please? A resolution authorizing the transfer of any interest Talbot County, Maryland holds in the portion of Brooks Lane to the Commissioners of St. Michael's and the execution of a quick claim deed to effectuate the same. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Clark, can you come on up? And uh, Mr. Thomas, you can, you can sit there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. I guess 
uh, for the council's uh, information, the Brooks Lane was actually uh, improved to the town standards. We constructed the road using asphalt as well as a stabilized cement. Uh, did that for 20 feet, and so ultimately, uh, the I guess this is associated with the Habitat for Humanity houses. I think eight houses were constructed. If not, it was seven. Um, and ultimately, this was going to be it was annexed into the town, and the county completed the improvements, and we're now working to transfer that road over to the town. Okay, that sounds great. Right. Did you need to add anything? Yeah, I would just yeah. clarify. So the, the town in 2017 annexed <coughs> the lands around Brooks Lane, and um, they were agreeable to accepting Brooks Lane as a town road, provided that it was upgraded to the standards and width that, that their code required. And now that that's been done, this is the, the next step. Okay, all right, appreciate that. Um, okay, um, do I raise a hand to introduce this? By council. This will be known as resolution number 314. And the public hearing will be held on Tuesday, January 11th at 6.30 p.m. That's the county manager. Yeah. I think Clay, you're up. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Council, President, members of the council. I have uh, several items this evening. The first one is board and committee appointments. Um, we are requesting council's consideration uh, to for the appointment of Sean Smith from the Talbot Soil Conservation District and Shannon Dill from the University of Maryland Extension Office as ex officio members to the Agriculture Resolution Board. So moved. Second. Madam Secretary, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. DeVilio? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Patrick? Aye. And I would ask Miguel to come forward. Uh, the next item I have is a request from the Department of Planning and Zoning to participate in the annual FY 2022 Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation program. Uh, this is uh, a matching funds program. As you can read in your agenda packet, we're requesting council approval to commit $100,000 in county agriculture transfer tax as matching funds to participate in this program. And Miguel is here to offer any further detail on this. Miguel? Um, thank you. This is a, a regular request we do. Um, uh, the MALF program requests um, c consideration by um, governing bodies uh, matching funds around this time of the year for each uh, round of, of MALF um, easement acquisitions. And so uh, they prefer that that's done in December of each year. Uh, this is going to be for FY22 funds. So anything that we apply towards a match would go towards um, their contribution to acquiring easements on the highest ranked MALF properties in Talbot County. Uh, our contribution would go towards that. Um, currently, just so you know, the latest I got uh, for November 2021 are uh, fund balance. Now, this is from agricultural transfer taxes that we retain. A portion does go to the state uh, our ending fund balance right now is about for a little over four hundred forty nine thousand dollars um typically every year we uh, ask the, the the council to consider an allocation of a hundred thousand i uh this this has been an important program i uh, have said before on this that i wish that we would put more than that minimum hundred thousand into this program um this is this is a program that that preserves talbot county's rural character by Purchasing preservation easements on these on these agricultural tracts that makes sure that farmland stays farmland, uh, and uh, and this is important. Um, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll move that we uh, support the request to participate in the program. I'll second. Okay, we got a motion. <coughs> we got a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, could you call the roll? Mr. Callahan. Aye. Mr. Devilio. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Pat. Aye. Thank you, Miguel. All of you. Did a good job. We do miss Martin. Martin yeah. normally comes in every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You always handle that. So yeah, I'm learning every day on that program. 
Uh, the next item I have, Council, is a request from the Roads Department to purchase scales for the use at the repurposing center. As you can read in your agenda packet, the Roads Department is requesting to purchase scales for the use of the repurposing center from a low bidder, Fairbank Scales, in the amount of $124,055.44. Two proposals were received. There are sufficient funds uh, for the purchase, and we'll be, we will be utilizing same discounts as applied to Wicomico County for a similar purchase. And, and also, it's in, in the budget. It is in the budget. Mm -hmm. Make a motion we approve the purchase of the scales. Okay. And I'll second. Okay, Madam Secretary, we have a motion to second it to um, purchase uh, the scales from the repurposing center. Call the roll, please. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. DeVilio? Aye. Mr. Lecter? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pat? Aye. I'll ask Ray Clark, the county engineer, to come forward, please. So the first item Ray has is a request from the Department of Public Works to accept a USDA loan and grant funding package in the amount of $1.650 million for Phase 5 of the St. Michael's sewer, uh, Sanitary Sewer System Restoration Project. As you read in your agenda packet, requesting council approve and accept USDA funding package in the amount of $1.65 million for additional engineering services and construction work to complete Phase 5 of the St. Michael's Sanitary Sewer System Restoration Project. And Ray is here to speak uh, and answer any questions in more detail. Yeah. Um, Council, on this one, um, Rural Development has come back to us on December 8th. Uh, what they've offered us is basically of the $1.65 million, um, $880,000 of that would be in a uh, new loan or funding through a new loan. And the um, we would also receive $770,000 in grant funding. This would be to finish up a lot of the uh, sewer collection system work that we have down in St. Michael's. Uh, we've been working with Schumer Incorporated as well as Rao Incorporated on this. So we would like to um, move forward and get your all's approval for the funding at this point. The, 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 the payments on that loan are, are, uh, are, are done through the, the rate payers for that sewer district. That is correct, yes. And we'll probably be looking at that towards may possibly a rate increase for next fiscal year. To cover those, those yes, sir. Th that share. Okay, Council, any other questions? No. Okay. We got a motion. We got a motion. We got a motion for Mr. Pack. I'll second. Okay. Um, Vice President Lesher. Madam Secretary, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Aye. Mr. Trillio? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pack? Aye. The next item that uh, the county engineer will have is request from the Department of Public Works toward bid number 1709, St. Michael's Pumping Station number three upgrade and rehabilitation, um, Talbot County, Maryland, change order number 21. As you read your agenda packet, requesting council approval to award change order number 21 to Schumer Incorporated in the amount of $1,286,105. And again, Ray is here to answer any questions uh, or provide any further detail. Yes, and we presented this to the county council, I think, on October uh, 12, or actually it's October 12, ultimately identifying this as a change order and requesting the council's approval on that change order, which was done, but it was contingent, contingent upon us receiving a funding package from rural development. Okay. Any questions? Council? No. Okay. I'll make a motion that we accept the bid. Okay. Second. Okay, we got a, uh, a motion from Mr. Pack and, and a second from Mrs. Price. Madam Secretary, could you call the roll? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. DeVilio? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pat? Aye. And the last item Ray has for you this evening, Department of Public Works is uh, requesting uh, your approval to award bid number 15-23 St. Michael's Phase 5 Sanitary Sewer System Rehabilitation and Grace Street Pump Station Replacement Engineering Services Amendment Number 17. As you read in your agenda packet, requesting County Council approval to award Amendment Number 17 to Round Incorporated in the amount of $183,375. And again, Ray is here to provide further detail on this request. And again, the Council, we did present this to you on October 12th. Um, at the same time, it was contingent upon us receiving the funds from rural development. So. And the motion accepts at 1523. I'll okay. second. Okay, we got a, a, a motion from Mr. Pack and a second from Mr. DeVilio. Madam Secretary, could you call the roll? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. DeVilio? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pack? Aye. Okay. Thank you, Thank Mr. Thank Park. You. Appreciate that. And then I would ask Cassandra Van Hoosier to come up. Cassandra here? Yeah. In the back. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, Council, um, 
We have tonight an update on the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA grant. As you read in your agenda packet, Talbot County will have a community survey on the American Rescue Plan Act available beginning this week to garner input on priorities from the public. The survey will be accessible uh, on our county's website at www.talbotcountymd.gov. And I do want to mention that um, council, as you know, council member uh, Pete Lesher is chairing uh, an internal committee uh, to work on um, developing a strategy for the use of um, the American Rescue Plan funds. And then I'll hand it over to Cassandra to share some further information. Thanks. Great. Thank you and good evening, Council. So our small group has uh, worked with Beacon at Salisbury University to put together a survey uh, to uh, solicit input from our citizens about what our priorities should be on using this money. Uh, this uh, survey will be available, as Clay said, on our website, but also in English and in Spanish. We're currently having it translated by our friends at the Chesapeake Multicultural Resource Center. So uh, we will be uh, calling on our networks to help distribute this information to the people um, and then uh, sending out uh, notices uh, through social media and all of our various channels uh, to uh, solicit participation. And really, uh, the group uh, felt that it was important to hear from citizens about uh, how uh, this money uh, could be used. We want to be very deliberate about it. We have um, a, a long window uh, to make those decisions, and uh, this is how we've chosen to go about it. Uh, and like Ray said, we do have a, a group of, of uh, county employees working on it, including being led by, by Mr. Lesher. So we feel that the, the survey um, is a representative of um, all of the ways that you can spend the money uh, and has been designed to uh, get the input that we're looking for. Yeah, just to remind us where we've been on this, um, we, we were awarded the, the funding through, through the uh, American Recovery Plan Act. Uh, we convened our team, uh, for the, our internal team, for the first time back in September. I think it was either late September, early October, we met with all of the municipalities uh, to, uh, because each of the municipalities is also receiving some of this funding. In fact, uh, in, in fact, one of the municipalities is, is receiving a significant amount more than, than the county itself uh, is receiving under this, under this act, under the allocations, uh, how, how they were calculated in this. Um, so we wanted to be able to coordinate uh, what, what we are doing with what the municipalities are doing. So we've, we've opened those channels of communication. This is the next step in, in gathering that input. And uh, again, we've been, we've been awarded now half of the, the funding of the, what is it, seven million? Seven point two. Seven point two million dollars. So half of that is in hand. We will get a second, I think, a second tranche, the balance of this funding. Uh, a year after the first, uh, if, if the first half was received, um, so and we have we have time to spend. We we, we need to remember that that this is this is one time uh, funding. Uh, it is extraordinarily flexible uh, funding. It can be used for a lot of different things, and and so part of what we're serving community interest over. And as we get this out, I will encourage you to get this out too our constituents to for that public feedback and we want as, as substantial a feedback as possible for uh, the, the more feedback we get the more valid those those results are uh, to feed into our our decision making for the the allocation of these funds and they can be f for things as broad as as um, uh, they can be assistance to our businesses and nonprofits it can be uh, uh, infrastructure projects such as, as broadband. And we're spe we specifically are looking at our broadband project for which we received federal funding from um, USDA. USDA. Uh, and because we applied in that, those early rounds of USDA funding, we, we have to, the terms of that grant from USDA were that we had to require um, a, sh a cost share from the customer for the capital charge, which of course gets added to their customer bill amortized over a period of, of, of years. Um, the subsequent rounds of funding, of broadband funding, have not required that. So we might look at this, at this, this could be a solution to that and it's, it's eligible for, for backfilling, backfilling some of those capital charges. Uh, we're looking at some, some uh, 
uh, other infrastructure projects. We, uh, we, we've got some capital projects, uh, some sewer district projects, and uh, we've, we've surveyed both internally, but now out into the, out into the community as well for what those, those needs are. Uh, we will get this information probably in early January. So our survey will stay open through the second week of January. Uh, we know we've got a holiday coming up and, and people are wrapping presents and, and hanging ornaments. So we wanna make sure that everyone has access to it. Um, and then it'll take a week or so for Beacon to analyze the results and then get them back to us. So we're looking at um, probably the third week of January, sometime in that time frame. How are we getting the survey out to the people? Just so, online? So um, we are having printed copies um, and um, again, reaching out to all of our networks. Um, we have a, a, like a plan laid out uh, in addition to our own website and our own social media. Um, you know, for example, uh, economic development and tourism both have, have um, the channels to, to rely on as do our other uh, county departments. So uh, we're also hoping that we'll do so, have, get some media outreach uh, to uh, have people looking uh, for the survey. It would be great if we could get both um, the printed newspaper and maybe even Talbot Spy to <laughs> print all of the questions and tell them where to log in rather than saying go log on and take a survey so they can right. actually see them if they could give us the space uh, to do that. And if Star Democrat and Talbot Spy is listening, that is a direct request. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Thank you for that. Okay. Great. great. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Sandra. And, and uh, Mr. Council President, members of the council, that ends the uh, county manager report for this week. As always, the staff thanks council for your support and leadership. Okay, good, and it's six thirty one, so there you go. Yep, there we go. This is something here. Okay, the continuation of the public hearing. We'll start the public hearing on down three oh eight and, and Madam Secretary, would you mind um, read the title, please? Resolution number 308, a resolution to rescind adoption of resolution number 281, a resolution to amend the Talk County Comprehensive Border and Sewer Plan, the plan to reclassify and remap portions of certain real property located in the town of Trap, Maryland, associated with the Lakeside Planned Unit Development, the Lakeside Project, formerly known as Trap East further described as tax map 54, parcel 304, tax map 55, parcels 14, 15, 17, 19, 44, 65, 83, and 85. And tax map 59, parcel 4, the total area consisting of 865 acres, more or less, the property from S2 and W2, areas where improvements or extensions to existing or construction of new community multi-use or shared sanitary facilities are programmed for progress within three to five years to S1 and W1, areas served or to be served by community multi-use or shared sanitary facilities which are existing under construction or have immediate priority status to amend the plan to add certain water and sewer capital projects related to the lakeside project and existing systems for the fiscal years 2020 through 2030 and to amend the plan to update the narrative description in the plan relative to the lakeside project and existing systems as amended without prejudice. Thank, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, before we start, Mr. Thomas, do you want to comment? Uh, no, I have nothing to comment at this time. Okay, okay so let's, uh, let's get ready to start the, uh, the public hearing. Um, and so when, when I call you up or you want to come up, um, say your name and your address, and I'll give you three minutes. And if you're representing an organization, I'll give you five minutes. So let's go ahead and, and start on this side over here on the first row. I'm here to listen tonight. Oh, you listen? Yeah. You're welcome to come up. All right, now. Okay. All right, no problem. No, to listen. no problem. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Um, second row. Yes, sir. It's fine. It's fine. Thank, good. You. Thank you for having yep. me. Yep. Um, uh, good evening, council members. Uh, for, for the record, Tom, Tom Allspock for uh, Topper Preservation Alliance. Um, I, I'll be um, fairly brief, I, I think, because uh, you've heard a lot of 
testimony about issues having that have come up and have arisen from uh, the, the existing Resolution 281. Um, you've heard lots of testimony uh, about the uh, condition of uh, Trap Creek, where the current trap wastewater plant discharges its effluent. Um, this has been uncontradicted testimony from experts and users of the creek. You've heard ample testimony about the impact, potential impact on the environment of the uh, spray field permit that's proposed for um, the uh, wastewater plant uh, on the eastern side of Route 50. So you're all familiar with that. Um, and it's our view that Resolution 281, as it, in, in its present incarnation, does not adequately protect against uh, especially the environmental impacts that, that um, have, have arisen and will continue to arise um, as a result of, of this, this wastewater uh, construction. Um, for example, you have an issue that I think the council should be aware of, of who, who is going to be ultimately responsible for operation and maintenance of this wastewater, this new wastewater treatment plant. I think there's a, a conception, I think it's a wrong conception that there is, but once this new trap plant is developed, there is some continuing obligation on the part of the developer to uh, own and operate it for a period of time. And in fact, in the original annexation agreement, um, that was put out to the public when the property east of 50 was annexed. Uh, it was represented that uh, for a period of at least three years, uh, the developer of public facilities, including a wastewater plant, uh, would be responsible for owner operation and maintenance of that plant. Um, that's no longer the case. The town and the developer made a, made a new deal between themselves. Uh, and the essence of that new deal is that uh, immediately, immediately upon completion of this new spray field wastewater plant, um, it is turned over to the town of Trap to own and operate. And this is not um, discretionary. It, the, the language of the agreement between the, in the DRRA between the town and, and the developer uh, says that the, <coughs> the, the new plant will be conveyed and the town will accept uh, the new plant. So, and, and I want to be careful here that I'm not, because I'm not trying to denigrate the town of Trap, but here we've got a municipality that's been operating a 200,000 gallon per day uh, traditional uh, wastewater treatment plant and is going to be suddenly responsible for owning and operating uh, a new plant uh, with brand new different technologies, spray field uh, technology uh, that is going to be licensed if they succeed in, in discharging up to a million and a half gallons per day of effluent. Huge difference. Uh, and so the question might arise, uh, what continuing obligation should there be on part of the part of the developer to ensure this plant will, will continue to operate for some reasonable period of time? I don't need to remind you folks about what happened at Y Mills and who, end up pay, who ended up paying for that plant. Um, we don't want to end up paying for the Trap East plant either. So that's something that, that I think should be addressed in perhaps uh, a different approach to Resolution 281. A second point I'll make is, uh, is one that, I, that I've, I believe I made before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, it's critical to understand that at the present time with regard to this connection that's going to exist between the, the Trapeze new facility and the existing plant, uh, there is no limitation in 281 on how many units can be connected to the existing plant. There is no limitation on the period of time uh, for which they can be connected, and they don't ever have to redirect their wastewater back over to the new straight spray field plant uh, until and unless the town of Trap uh, asks them to do so. I think we have to be more specific in requiring uh, limitations on um, how many of any new units can be connected to the plant, and if any are, for how long they can stay connected. Um, the, the 281 currently refers to uh, connections for the startup phase of the new development, but startup is not defined anywhere. We have no idea whether that means 20 houses, 120 houses, or 250 houses. We need to, to control, control that. Um, there's not a whole lot more that I want to, to um, add tonight because um, you've heard from me before on this, but I think that, it, that it's important for the, the county to recognize that the county has some responsibility here. Uh, I noticed some concern about uh, seeming to meddle in the internal affairs of the town of Trap with regard to how they want to gr grow. But a, a new facility such as the one that's proposed now 
uh, as not to mention the existing facility, has, has serious impacts for your constituents in the county. Trap Creek is a, is a, county, a county water body, and the users, the watermen, and uh, all who are affected by the water in Trap Creek are your constituents, and that's directly connected to the new plant, to the existing plant. And the new plant, of course, is going to impact more, much more than likely uh, the Miles uh, Creek side of, of, the, uh, of the county. Um, and the, the county needs to be concerned about that. So we, we can't be over deferential to the town here. And, and we have to remember that, that um, uh, the county has responsibility for the people in the county who will be affected by this development. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. You want me to? Keep... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. Anybody else on that second round? Okay. On the third row? The, the, fourth, the fourth row? Mm -hmm. Good evening. Okay, good evening. And Merry Christmas, by the way. Yeah, thank Nobody's you. Nobody's bringing up any Christmas <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Got a little cheer. Yeah. Okay, let me get my notes real quick, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Powers. I've been a resident since 2007. I'm an engineer, like the county engineer you have, PE licensed. And I've spent 40 years uh, designing, building, process flow for wastewater plants, chemical plants, oil and gas worldwide. I retired three years ago. I'm spending a lot more time focused on this area and what I can do to help. And I live in Talbot County permanently. Um, it's interesting. Um, I've listened to all the talk I was here in October you granted me three minutes I hope I get that at least a little bit I have a couple points to make but um, I've done some due diligence and studies of various things I've contacted a lot of people I was uh, chairman of WEMA for two years in 2012 2013 WEMA stands for water and wastewater manufacturers Association of America 76 companies uh, quite a bit I reached out to Frank Rabori. I know him personally uh, in Kansas. He's the one that's looking at the uh, biological system that Trap was looking at uh, called Smith and Loveless. And uh, he has some concerns because of the volumes and the rest of it that's involved here. Um, we have political positions being made. You all have heard those. Uh, there's financial advantages and disadvantages. Um, there's lack of, I use the word lack of environmental considerations, as, as Ms. Uh, Laura Price brought up tonight, you know, about this other resolution and trying to take more time and look at things and try to improve upon it. I'm also a believer in things that I've seen around the world and been involved in, some complete disasters that have been turned around into some models and state-of-the-art type activity. I would think this council would like to make, however this project goes, a, a model of how it can be done right and not going down the path that's going now, which could be a disaster. Uh, there's negative impact to the county, safety, the people, the fishermen, the watermen. Um, the builders from another state, he, in my opinion, studying his background and other projects and all, he has no ownership in this thing. He doesn't even probably know what the Chesapeake Bay is about and how sensitive it is to a lot of things. Um, there's other projects you might want to look at that they've done that are in question. Um, the project uh, um, can be modified, corrected. There's a lot of things that I found that was interesting. But what the previous gentleman brought up, sustainability. 25, seconds, Mr. 25 years, 30 years, whatever. Uh, the seawater intrusion on the site is serious. They're going to have wells pulling water out. Seawater is more dense. It is not going to absorb into the ground like they think. The 87 acres for the spray system, when I did my calculations and looked at it, it's, it's a broken up trapezoids and all the way the land's laid out. They're only going to be able to spray on about 60 acres, not 87. There's corners of it that you just can't, you know, irrigate properly. Um, and uh, Mr. Powell, the, that's three minutes. Can I just have 10 more seconds? Sure. Okay. Okay. The holding pond. An interesting that the Haynes report put out. I read that, went through the details, contacted them. They, they admitted they might have missed something, which is the holding pond for that month, two months. When it's done, it's, it's got a permanent layer in there. They have to pump that out and put it on the spray pond. They didn't take that in consideration of this, this whole uh, situation. Time. 
Okay. So I had two more notes, but I think uh, reading through USDA manuals and how they go about doing stuff, I just think there's a lot that could be done here that could improve the situation instead of making it worse. If you email this, the additional comments, we would be, that would be great. Yeah, I, and I've got... Uh, just email be, them to us. Thank to be you. fair, 10 points of very direct engineering-related type stuff that maybe the county would be very interested in. And I could okay. also recommend you put together a committee with a broad group of public subject matter experts to take a look at this you're talking about by January. I'd be willing to help out and make this uh, something that makes a difference. Okay, thanks a lot, appreciate it. Anybody else on Mr. Powell's uh, bench? Okay, the, the last route? Okay, come on up. How are you guys doing? Hi, Brian Schmidt. Um, I, uh, I'm on the uh, trap, plan uh, trap Town Council. I'm on the uh, Trap Planning Commission. Um, really kind of going off here on my own, sort of my own opinions here, if you will. So we haven't kind of collaborated anything uh, together. But uh, some of my own uh, sort of uh, comments, if you will. Yes. So um, with that being said, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say uh, what we're saying here. Um, I in my opinion, I, I've been involved with this. Uh, I've been on the Trap Planning Commission for about two and a half years. Uh, two months into my uh, tenure on the commission, Bob Rowell shows up and says, hey, we're starting this again. So I've kind of been involved with this from the beginning. Um, my background is not uh, environmental uh, sewer systems or uh, wastewater treatment plants or anything like that. I depend on MDE to come up with uh, the doctors that work there to uh, do their due diligence and, and bringing us the proper uh, uh, technology and the things that need to be done. Um, I think uh, some of the concerns that you guys have had, this, the simple truth about some of this is that about 18 months ago, the, the Trap Town Council started looking for a new wastewater treatment plant. And we've spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to figure out three different PERs on how to make this happen. Um, there's been several um, ways that we, we feel like we can go. Um, but um, we've had discussions with our engineers. We've had discussions with Lakeside. Um, the best plan our way forward. As you know, from a government planning point of view, this process takes time. We have the responsibility to the people living in the town of Trap, the ones who are paying for this upgrade, to plan well. I ask that you rescind to, uh, not to rescind, excuse me, 281, allow the town of Trap's elected officials to manage the lakeside development. With the help of MDE, our town engineers, our planner, we will see that this development is moving in the right direction. Allow TRAPS Council to continue moving forward in planning a new ENR plant in the best way we see fit for the town of TRAP and not put time restrictions on us to make this happen, as this has the ability to be detrimental to all involved. Anyone has the right to come to our meetings, to our council meetings, to our commission meetings. You guys just seem to be blessed to have everybody show up and give your opinions. Quite honestly, we have nobody. Um, I, we have one gentleman from the town of Trap who comes to every meeting. Um, but I, why you guys are so blessed, I'm not sure. Um, but um, you know, I, I do encourage everybody who's really involved, people who want to know what's really going on. Um, there's been a lot of um, conversation in the spy about um, what I find, what I think is more hearsay. Um, than what is actually going on. Um, the person who seems to uh, report most has never come to a single meeting, um, has never asked any of us any questions. Um, and I find that a little, I don't know, not right. Um, but anyway, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I really appreciate um, you're one of the only ones from TRAP here. It makes a big difference with TRAP being here. So I really appreciate you being here. No problem. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's go over here to, to my right. Um, first row. Okay. So, second row.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Monica Adi, and I live at 229 Madison in St. Michael's. And I want to thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to speak in support of Resolution 308. I'm sorry. Oh, you want me to use the other one? Yeah. I can move. Okay, should I start over? Yeah, would you please? Okay, sure. Um, good evening. I'm Monica Adi, and I live at 229 Madison in St. Michael's, and I want to thank you first for the opportunity to speak in support of Resolution 308. Um, as Mr. Alsbach mentioned, there are so many reasons that have been put forward by citizens and experts about why Resolution 281 should be rescinded. So in my three minutes, I'm not going to try to speak to all of them, but I want to focus on the learnings that we all have from another spray irrigation facility here in Talbot, and that, of course, is the plant at the preserve at White Y Mills. Now, you're all very familiar with this. Um, because that plant, um, going back over two decades, had, there have been problems in keeping in compliance with the pollutant discharge requirements. Um, the plant's operated by the Property Owners Association and serves 53 homes. Uh, and the county, of course, is now on a path to take over the operation of this plant. I um, recently had the opportunity to look at documents from PIA requests about the history of the preserve. And MDE issued the first discharge permit way back in 2003. And there was an expectation, I think, that MDE would make sure that the plant stayed in compliance or came in for this, in, during this period. And they were very involved. Um, they made site visits. They issued violation notices. They advised the Property Owners Association on how they can comply. And the Property Owners Association, who were kind of left in the lurch because the developer filed for bankruptcy, um, it seemed that they did the best they could with limited resources. But at the end of the day, MDE simply wasn't able to keep that plant in compliance. Um, and the county takeover will, I think, at last fix this problem. But there's been environmental damage from years of pollutant discharge and that's going to remain in the environment for years to come. So we don't want to let the same thing happen at Trap East. Um, that spray irrigation facility will serve 50 times more homes than the preserve plant. Um, there need to be achievable and enforceable requirements in place to make sure that pollutant discharge from that plant doesn't impair Talbot. And we all hope that MDE will take care of us. There were a lot of people who turned out at the MDE hearing to make that point and give su suggestions. But we can't count on MDE to take care of this. One second, Mark. OK. Um, the council really needs to take the lead here to protect Talbot by, and the first step to do that is to rescind Resolution 281. I thank you very much for your time. Go to, the, go to the third row. Anybody like to, to speak? Okay. Um, the, the fourth row? I'm in the back row. Okay. Anybody else? That, is there it, are people oh, outside. I'm sorry. There are people outside. Oh, it is? Is, is, there, um, is there a list outside? Um, uh, no, 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 nobody signed up or anything? Okay. Check for one second here. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Five minutes if you're representing yourself three minutes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> Roland Brown, um, Boone Creek Road, Oxford, Maryland. <clears throat> I'm not representing anybody other than all the people that care about the quality of life in Talbot County. And I'm not going to add 
to any of the previous statements about why I think that you should rescind 281. Um, you were elected by the people of Talbot County to make hard choices, to uphold the quality of life in Talbot County, to uphold the comprehensive plan. Not easy being where you are, I know that, but I'm urging you to write what many in this county perceive to be a wrong decision. And uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Okay, Thank you. It. Appreciate you coming. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Come on up. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Um, my name is Bob Flower. I live at 29638 Ferry Point Drive in Trap. And uh, I am uh, very concerned about this project in total. Uh, I moved down here in um, about 20 years ago. Actually, it's been more than that. Uh, I think I've been down here since 2000. A little nervous here. I don't speak in front of crowds much. You can subtract that, please. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I moved down here for probably some of the many reasons many people do down here. The rural character, the clean water, the open spaces, the fishing, the, uh, the you know, they're just beautiful life. And we've all heard enough, and there's been so much uh, published about this wastewater treatment plant, and that concept, but my concerns go on much farther than that. 2,500 homes in Trap, they, 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 they don't have 400 homes in that town or something small. That's huge. Um, what's it going to do to the police, the schools, the, the, the hospital, the, the fire departments, the, the traffic, uh, uh, the other pollution from cars? Uh, uh, on and on, it, it, it takes away the, the whole character and sets a, a, a huge bad precedent for the Eastern Shore and Talba County to have 2,500 homes. Bang. I, I, uh, I, I, I beg you to represent the constituents that you have that uh, all I can hear is people talk and write and, and on social media and uh, Talbot Spy, I saw a Washington Post article today. Uh, you know, this thing is just bad for us. It's okay for Glen Burnie, but it's bad for us. And I, I hope you look at the whole picture, not just the sewer, but the whole picture and, and, and get us out of this mess so we can enjoy this area that we call home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Power. Appreciate it. Does anybody else have any other comments that they, they want to share with us tonight on uh, 308? We, 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 did, we did have some sign-ups. I just was delivering oh, the did? sheet. Okay. Uh, we, we also have, uh, if, if, he is, if he's still here, Jock Beebe, Foxford. Uh, okay. We have uh, Gail Scott. Gail Scott. Signed up. We have a person with more challenging handwriting, Mark. <laughs> Julian. Hi, thanks. Mark Johnson, maybe? And uh, a. Um, Cynthia Taylor of High Banks. They can hear us out there. Yes, they can. Yep. So if any if anybody would like you know if anybody would like to come up that's still out and hasn't heard their name or hasn't had a chance to come up, please, please come up. Okay. And all those people were signed up for Lakeside. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I guess we're at the point where. Um, We'll close the public hearing. Um, Secretary? Um, Do we, can we leave that open for 
comment? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just thinking that there was a. There's been a lot of information All right. passed so around. Council must like really yes. added, um, keep the keep it open. Yes. I, I'm, okay. I'm going to specifically. I, I do think that we need time to review the many exhibits that we've seen on this and the testimony, uh, and provide an opportunity uh, to. Uh, uh, confirm or question any of what is before us, invite those who may not have had a chance to respond to be able to do so. Uh, and I'm going to propose we keep the record open until January 4th uh, so that we can review it at the January 11th council meeting. Okay. Is council okay with that? Yes. I think that's a good idea, Mr. Count, uh, Mr. Vice President. Um, we've, we've heard a lot of information in the last couple of days, and um, I think it's uh, it's only it's only right for us to gather all the information and come back to you guys, and um, and, and see some of our views and, and, and get all like Mrs. Price said a little while ago, um, and, and, and gather the information and, and, and try to resolve all this for us. Would would it be possible yeah. to have to to keep it open through maybe the fourteenth and then? Review it on the 25th. Think about what Mrs. Price, is, what she'll have, that <coughs> comment that'll come in from that as well might be beneficial. Okay. I, I agree that with makes, that, that, makes, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So did you get that, Madam Secretary? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Which, I mean, gives us time to make any right. amendments. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean wait until the 14th. If you have suggestions for amendments um, to the resolution that was introduced this evening if you mm -hmm. can get those those to us as well this may be a situation where mm -hmm. the resolution that was introduced earlier this evening maybe that is a standalone uh, we can only introduce amendments to the comp water and sewer plan again four times a year that's self-imposed we need to fix that because if we wanted to do something related to um, you know 281 um, what, I, what I would like to remind everybody, again, is rescinding 281 by itself doesn't necessarily do anything. Two different legal opinions, whether it has, has any uh, um, effect. Uh, we know that amending a comp water and sewer plan and sending that to MDE absolutely has an effect. And they will, you know, if we make amendments to it, we send them to MDE and they will approve the amendments that we make. I think most people on the council have um, felt that that's the case. We went through a process with, um, you know, with this, with 281 to receive the comments. If that is, you know, taken under advisement, it may or it may not turn into an amendment to the comp water and sewer plan. The problem is now timing because we can't do it in January. It means waiting till March again, which is why possibly amending the resolution that was introduced earlier this evening. Um, but maybe they are two separate items. As I said earlier, that resolution offers a good amount of protection. Doesn't you know? I know there's people here that just want the whole the whole development just to be stopped. Um, whether that horse has left the barn, I don't know. I do know that I am in touch with. Um, some good people at MDE. Um, they were forwarded a lot of the information that was received last night. Um, you know, timeline of whether that permit was or was not properly issued um, by MDE um, after a vote in 2004 by the County Council at that time, you know, to not approve it, and then, and then MDE issuing a permit um, in 2005 or 2006, and then the permit expiring. So we have a lot of answers that we need to get from MDE as well. Completely different administration back in, you know, the 2004, 5, 6 range. Um, so there's a lot of information that we need to gather. So it may be every, it might be a little, a lot, or something in, in between. But know that I believe everybody on this council is taking all of the information very seriously and um, we're not dragging our feet. We just want to make sure that we have all the information and like Mr. Lesher said, you know, we need to hear from, you know, the other parties, you know, from TRAP, from the developer and get all of that information so that we can make, you know, the right decision um, for Talbot County. Uh, so and hopefully Ms. you'll be patient with that. Mr. Price, just to follow up with that, Mr. Thomas, 
we have had failures before with wastewater treatment facilities. The council has, just most recently with Y Mills, we've acted as quick as we can. And as, as you bring that up with the quarterly self-imposed rule, it, would it would it benefit us to, to adjust that so that it's quarter, because we don't want to obviously open up the can of worms and do it regularly, but quarterly more often under emergency situations well, see, or I think something what we've, along that? And, I, and, I'll, and I don't mind saying this publicly. We did it, I believe we did it quarterly so that we don't get all kinds of requests at all times of the year because it is very tedious. But I certainly would hope that the county council, as the governing body of the comprehensive water and sewer plan, has the ability in a situation where, okay, if we get some information or whatever and we want to introduce something in January, I shouldn't, we shouldn't have to wait till March. So I don't know if we can do anything with that process. I know we can introduce a resolution, but then we have to go through a whole public hearing with that. Right, we could do an amendment to the plan. I mean, I, I think it's a simple clarification that that quarterly rule doesn't apply to the council. The problem is though, that's an amendment to the plan and now we're at the point where that can't come forward until March. And I, that's the next. But right now we are in the middle of a situation that we need to take care of. So I don't know, who's gonna slap our hands if we did it? in January True. and I'm making that announcement right here that if you know hopefully no if, if we find something that we've got to do and we need to do it in January by golly I think that we should do it and I hope nobody's going to give us a hard time well, about I think, it I think what we'll do is <laughs> let, let's, let's get what we're, we're doing here by the end of January and we'll have some direction by then right but we can't introduce anything again until March and I think that we need to be very public about the fact that if we have an emergency situation then we should consider doing it mm -hmm. and break our own rules mm -hmm. okay all right the, does anybody have anything else to say yeah, yes sir come on up Bill. thank you mr kelly yeah no problem um since you waited one day <clears throat> excuse me there are there are many questions many factual questions and i just on behalf of the pardon me my um i'm bill anderson I live at 21715 Heavenly Haven Road in Sherwood, Maryland, and I am the chair of the Public Works Advisory Board. And in, in response to Ms. Price, I would just like to offer the um, efforts and um, talents of the members of the Public Works Advisory Board to assist you in answering any factual questions that you may have based on the record that we have been reviewing in order to prepare comments to MDE on the proposed permit. So thank we stand you. ready to help you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. So at their next meetings, the planning, both the Planning Commission and the Public Works Advisory Board, I know that they've given us some comments already on, mm -hmm. on this, and I know that they're going, you guys are going to give us your feedback on this particular resolution, but in light of some of the new information that we received in, you know, uh, in the last, last night and, and all, I, I would like to hear their thoughts on that information as well in addition to the right. resolution introduced this evening? I agree entirely. Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful. Okay. It's fine. Miguel, Ray, add that to your agenda. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so where we're at, we're going we're gonna to leave it open. Um, uh, Madam Secretary, could you, could you read back so everybody understands what we're doing here? Yes, resolution number 308, will be, the record will be held open until um, January 4th, excuse me, 14th. Right. And um, it'll be considered for vote on January 25th. Okay, that's good. All right, so let's, okay, let's move on um, to more of the public hearing. Um, let's move on to uh, resolution of, uh, 310. Madam Secretary, can you read the title, please? Resolution number 310, a resolution authorizing the transfer of any interest Talbot County, Maryland holds in Flood Avenue to the town of Easton and the execution of a quick claim deed to effectuate the same. Okay. Um, Mr. Thomas, you can say a few words? Yes, just, just briefly. So this is this stems from a request that the town of Easton made in September, uh, requesting that the county convey any interest it has in Flood Avenue and the town would uh, take over the maintenance of that yeah. at its own expense. Okay. It's, and it's the portion between uh, uh, Port Street and Glenwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's, um, let's, let's go ahead and uh, 
Ms. Morris is putting the map up there for reference. Okay. Mr. Thomas, was my question when this was initially introduced, has it been resolved as far as ownership of Flood Avenue? I think we have a plat to that effect. We've got stuff in here. So, is it? There should have been a plat on your desk. Bigger version. Can somebody translate it? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, I think that shows the proportions of ownership, and it wouldn't. Uh, I mean, the, the county would essentially be giving them a quick claim deed, just giving up any whatever title. We're not saying we own this or that. It's just whatever interest we have, we're conveying to the town. Similar to like what we're doing with, with Brooks Lane. So on this on this yellow on this colored map, Mr. Thomas is flood the one in yellow. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I don't think that's with the line going through. It is. Right. It, you can kind of see it says flood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Then it Yes, Flood Avenue runs between Glen, Glenwood and Port Street in yellow. Thank you. Okay, so, so, um, so, so Council, um, let's, let's go ahead and um, open the public hearing here. And, um, and I'm going to start here on my left. Is, is anybody on the, on the left side going to come on up and, and talk about uh, uh, Resolution 310? Okay. Is anybody here on my right? Anybody here on want to come on up and talk about 310? Okay. So, so Council, you, you got any you got any questions? Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and uh, you Let the town pay for the road instead of us? Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Riding the road, I don't think we've paid any money to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I guess at this time we'll go ahead and open the public hearing Okay. And, and is, this matter is eligible for a vote? Okay. Go, go ahead. So, uh, Council, it's come to my attention, and this is not a showstopper. I mean, if you, you could give me authority or, or Patrick authority mm -hmm. to negotiate with the town to resolve an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so when they overlaid Flood Avenue, they elevated the, the roadway slightly. And what's happening is when we get heavy rains now, we have some flooding that, in, that impinges upon our roads department storage building. So we just need to work with the town to resolve that matter. Mm -hmm. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that before you uh, take action. So you Flood Avenue wanna... is flooding our roots department? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's something that can easily be resolved. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. And that you might use it as a caveat to your approval. Um, I'm sure it could be resolved. But I wanted you to be aware of it. Yeah, OK. All right. So, so, well, so why don't you we give you some time to work on that, man? Because that's an issue. If we put it off two weeks, will that give you an opportunity to meet with the mayor? And but it's not two weeks. It's, it's going to be January, January before January that happens. Thursday. Yeah, I, I think we meet with him. Th we, is we it do. this coming Thursday? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we could, that's we could bring this back on, on the twenty-first next week. Next week. Okay. okay. So, so we want to we want to we want to hold this open. Okay. Okay. We want to hold it open. Okay. All right, so let's uh, let's go for uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, let's let's uh, do 311. Resolution 311. Resolution number 311. Resolution to amend the Talk County Council rules of procedure to clarify certain procedures regarding the adoption of numbered and administrative resolutions, the filing of petitions, the drafting of legislation, and the conduct of public hearings and to correct outdated and inconsistent language. Okay. Um, 
I think this is, is well overdue. I think the, 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 the council's uh, objective here is to try to work through some of the, the, the tough situations that we've been in here in the last you know, couple of years. And um, uh, Mr. Thomas, you want to you comment a little bit on that? I, I can. I, mean, I think most of this is pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's, that's not any radical yeah. changes. It's just clarifying some things that, that really needed to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some outdated and repetitive language in here. Um, it brings some clarity to the petition process. Um, and it distinguishes between number and administrative resolutions instead of just referring generally to resolutions, which you know, just clarifies a, an actual, a practice of the council. So that's really uh, provides for hearing on, on number of resolutions, which, um, you know, again, Council has traditionally held the public hearings on a number of resolutions and not on administrative resolutions, but now it puts that in the, in the shore. Okay. Policy. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, all right. So we're we're gonna we're gonna open that um, to the public, and um, so so anybody that would like to comment on three eleven on some of the proposals, um, you're welcome to come up here. Yeah, come, come on up. <clears throat> For the record, Tom Allspach again. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, I'm going to confess that I I, I was not um, prepared to, for this tonight, which is my fault, not not yours. Um, I I had uh, forgotten or neglected to advise myself that it was a public hearing on this tonight. Um, I did read about it some time ago, but so I'll just wing it since uh, this is my chance to speak. I, I don't have any prepared remarks, but. Um, I was concerned, as, as I recall, when I read through this, the, this um, proposal uh, some time ago, <clears throat> that there are new um, restrictions on the right of petition. And we all have had a lot of experience with the right to petition in the last few weeks. Um, my concern is, if I recall correctly, that under this two proposal, um, the council can basically simply ignore a petition and it's deemed denied. Is that? about right they decide not to take any action so you can't have a petition just sitting out there waiting in indefinitely the, yeah, yeah. if you don't take action on that yeah or yeah time. I, I i um i think that, that that provision amounts to a provision saying you have no right to petition uh, i think if you have a right to petition you have a right to an opportunity to be heard uh in however truncated a manner that may be uh, but i think simply to uh essentially ignore a petition and it goes away is not is not a good idea um, and, I, and I, I don't have in my head what the remainder of the provisions were on that particular subject to, to try to comment intelligently on them but maybe I can send something to you if you leave the record open sure. but I, I just I just would, would leave, leave you with the thought that <clears throat> all of us who sat through it including you know bless his soul Dan Watson who not only sat through it but actually gave it the, the three hours plus two hours, whatever, everyone felt that was not the way this should all unwind, including Dan. Um, but on the other hand, you learned an awful lot from what he did, and so did I. And, and, and giving and, and recognizing the right to petition that led to that, um, you would, have, would, not, would not have gotten the information that you got from him, uh, whether you agree with it or not, there was a lot of stuff that he put out there that otherwise would not have seen the light of day. Uh, and so I think we need to be very careful about l limiting too much uh, the right of a citizen, especially if you have some additional folks besides one person supporting you, as, as Dan did, 400 and some. Uh, limiting the right of a person like that to, to actually be heard, at least to some degree, if not five hours worth, for some limited, reasonably limited period of time, um, to, to express a, an opinion on a subject that you might not have, have considered. So that's, that's all I have to say, and thanks for okay. letting me jump in here. Thank you, Mr. Alsop. I appreciate that. Okay. Any, anybody else over here on, on the left hand side? Okay, how, how about the. Uh, yeah, come on out. So um, I wasn't very clear. My name is Sherry Wilcoxon. Yeah. I live on Waverly Road in Easton, Maryland. So I wasn't very clear because you kind of skimmed over it. Um, is the administrative resolution um, what y'all did for the Talbot boys, an administrative resolution, and now you're changing 
the rules to make what, what happened be fair because it did not fall in the proper channels? It's just, add, it's just stating in the process what they already do. But it wasn't in the process before. It doesn't mean they don't have the authority to adopt administrative resolutions. Okay. So written motion, essentially. So it's not in the rules, and you can do it. You can do it anyway. So anything that's not in the rules is acceptable. They have the ability to make motions. It's administrative action. Okay, and and we can't petition that, right? That's yes. That's what the court said. Well, but but now you're changing the rules to match what the court said. No, now we're putting it in the rules to bring some clarity to a process that's clearly generating a lot of confusion over the last few months. A little sleight of hand, in my opinion, but it does appear that you're changing the rules now to match what was already done inappropriately. I think uh, Ms. Price even suggested that it might have been inappropriate at the time, and I think it was very unfair to the citizenship. We should have been allowed to bring this to petition and let the members of Talbot County uh, vote. That's what should have happened, and it's very disappointing that it didn't happen that way. And it, it does appear that now, after the fact, you're changing the rules to match what's already been done. Thank you. That's how law is Thank you, Mr. Wilcoxon. Thank you. Um, okay. Anybody, anybody here on the left? Okay, let's start over here on the right. Anybody over here on the right? Okay. All right. Okay, so. All right. So at this time, this Mr. Yeah. President, I'm, I'm going to suggest with this one, and I hadn't planned on doing this, but uh, because of the public input, I'm going to suggest that we uh, that we keep the record okay. over on this and mm -hmm. uh, and put it on the agenda for our, our December 21st okay. meeting. Can we have a little discussion on this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's, 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 there's a few things, there's three things that I um, am uncomfortable with. Um, it says, you know, and this is what we have done. Council may, this is on, on the administrative resolution, may, but is not required to hold a public hearing on an administrative resolution. If the council elects to hold a public hearing, then it shall be read on two different occasions. Administrative resolutions for which no public hearing is held shall only be read once prior to a final adoption. I have a problem with that. It should always have an, even if we don't have an official public hearing, I do not believe that an administrative resolution should be introduced and voted on on the same day with no opportunity for the public to at least email us. So I, I have a real problem with that. Whether it says we don't have to have the official public hearing, I think that we should, okay? But certainly I do not like that line at all that says shall be read only once prior to final adoption. I know we've done it, but I think it's wrong. So that's, that's one thing that I would like changed, you know, in this, or it will not have my support. And that was on page 12. On page 6, a couple things. Um, well, I guess it is about petitions. Maybe we've gone too far. Okay, no, we don't want someone coming in and petitioning us and possibly having, you know, 12 different agenda items. Something needs to be changed. I'm not sure this is it because I think people need a chance to be heard. Um, you know, whether it's a 10 minute, I don't, I don't know that you put some arbitrary time limit on it, but for us to be able to say that we're not even going to, to hear something publicly, I mean, I guess they always have public comment at the end of the meeting where they could bring something up. I think maybe we need to work on that section and try to find, again, some type of compromise where someone, the public feels that they have the opportunity to be heard without abusing the system. So I'd like to see some work done um, on that, see what else we might be able to do. Um, and then this is more internal for the council. Up until, I would say, the last six months, a council member could work with the county attorney and work on legislation. Um, and then recently it's like, well, now you have to let two other council members know that you're working on legislation. Sometimes that's a good idea and sometimes it's not. Right? You want a chance to, to, to work through it. So it, that section now 
um, and we never did it. I mean, in 11 years, we never did that um, until, like I said, I guess this summer. Because it's, it's always been there, but we never, but but we never followed it. I mean, any one of us and the three councils I've been on, you know, we could work with the county attorney. And I don't think anybody's abused it. Um, maybe prior councils. Maybe prior councils to the three that I've been on, maybe there was somebody who, who did that, who shall remain nameless. But I don't think anybody has abused that where, you know, we're taking up all the county attorney's time and writing, you know, umpteen pieces of legislation. Um, so it, what it used to say, or what it says currently is, it shall include an acknowledgement by at least two other members of the council that they're aware of the request. We've never followed it, right? Um, but now the language says all other members of the council and the county manager shall be copied on the request. That's even going beyond notifying two members. That's saying basically, I, you know, Mr. Callahan wants to put forth and we all know what's going on. And then if you know what registration is being, you know, worked on, I mean, I just feel like that's something that is between the council member or two and the county attorney. And as long as it hasn't been abused, I think that we should be able to do that and work on pieces of legislation and then it's always presented publicly, right? And it's always, um, we have the seven day notice where right. I mean, once it's drafted. Another way to say it would be that instead of having to have the other two members acknowledge, because it kind of creates a scramble if we're doing something last minute to get somebody to write, just say that two members of the council should be copied on the request so that they're... Aware. I don't know that that needs to happen because the council members, if you know, if Mr. Pack puts forth something, it has to be done seven days in advance. I personally think that's sufficient. I think the council members, we're all grown-ups, we're all elected, we're not going to abuse um, the, the county attorney's time, and the council members are notified seven days in advance, and I think that's sufficient. I don't think that while we're working on a request that we need to have the county manager and every other council member copied on the request. I think we work on that and then seven days in advance, which we have, which is what we have been doing, so the Tuesday before the council meeting, and then it is published in the agenda on Friday before the council meeting. So That's I don't know that point. we need all that. But you're, you're, you're certainly, certainly entitled to your, your opinion, um, but for sake of time and for order, um, I would ask that you submit any changes okay. in writing so that the council members, as, we, as you were just talking about, can be aware of those changes and then come in on the 21st, and if any council member wants to support that amendment, they can do so. Right. I'm, no. being, I'm being transparent okay. saying, no, no, saying it in public. It's what we've done for just, 11 years. Just for so. a point of order, if you could just submit those changes in writing. But it is a point of order. They, I'm in a discussion period, and I'm being transparent they, about the three items in well, this, this is bill. a public hearing on it, so if you could submit those to us in writing, that way council members can decide whether they, they want to support okay. it. Okay, but we're leaving the public hearing open. Mm -hmm. So now I'm being transparent. The public has heard my suggestions. Instead of keeping it closed session and just sending it to the council, and well, it we, has to be read into the record. Any amendment has to be read to the record. Sure, but now they have a chance to comment on it, mm -hmm. and we decided that we were going to have a little discussion on it. So okay. those are my three items. Right. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Frank. Any other council? Uh, you know, we'll have more time to discuss this, yeah. and we can okay. look at these these okay. amendments. Although, although I would point out that the that the administrative resolution is really a formalization of, uh, of simply a motion. Uh, and it is a substitution for what would be an executive act if this county had a county executive, which we do not. This, bo this body has to sit as both our legislative body uh, and as our legislative body we act on, on, on ordinances and we act right. on resolutions, numbered resolutions. We we have kind of formalized executive actions as a form of of uh, administrative resolution, and and I I I don't I don't see the uh, the need to add uh, complication or a uh, or a two meeting requirement uh, to to the administrative resolutions for what would be executive acts. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, one of one of the uh, unnumbered resolutions, I believe, was a decision by this body to suspend enforcement of a, of a particular uh, uh, provision in our siting ordinance, which had been challenged, uh, and it gave it provided immediate relief. And if we had a two meeting requirement, we would not have been able to provide relief when so we were when our when our laws were found to be 
uh, violations of the of the First Amendment. So that allowed immediate relief. Maybe the, there are, needs to be a, a, an opportunity for certain things, but I think that there have been some resolutions in the past couple of years that should have not been administrative resolutions, and I guess that's my point. That well, that, that, that's a legitimate debate, debate about what, what is a legislative act versus what is an right. executive act. Exactly. I, think we need, I think we need to provide, leave this provision as proposed for those executive actions. So I don't know if there is a way to um, be, have a better explanation of the difference of what's appropriate as an administrative resolution versus a numbered resolution. Right? Regardless of whether you agree with the vote on the last couple of administrative resolutions, those were clearly things that involved public input being a best practice. And I'm not sure how you put some type of a definition on that. We don't want the administrative resolution to be abused. And the fact is, whether you agree with the, you know, the vote on the last particular one, the public deserved to be heard. And we just want to make sure that that, um, that administrative resolution isn't abused in that way when it's clearly people want to be heard. It should be a numbered resolution. So sure, I'm sure, I could add some language that distinguishes between subject matter for numbered resolutions versus subject matter for administrative resolutions that might help bring some clarity. Okay. <laughs> that might be helpful. Thank you. Would, would there be a way with the petitions? I, I seem to recall a MAKO class on public meetings, and they were discussing it, and the, the speaker started off the meeting by saying, when he has his way, they don't have public meetings or public discussion and the or public comment, public comment, sorry. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have public comment in their meetings um, because it was a matter of, of work, time, and if and he was also similar to us where it just took one council member to, to get something on the agenda. Would there be a way, and I don't know if it would make sense or not, but for petitions to come to individual council members for them to decide whether or not to put it on the agenda, because it only takes one of us, one of us, to be willing to put you on the agenda. If there would be a way to, or may, maybe that, maybe that would be undue pressure, or um, I, I don't know. It just seems if you can't convince one of the five to put you on the agenda, you're probably not going to get three votes. So it seems that it's a losing call, so maybe public comment is the time for you to voice it to then gain public support. I, I, I don't, I, I. Okay, and, uh, wait. Yeah. fair enough. So, so let, let's go ahead. We know we, we know we need to clean some things up with, with Mr. Thomas, and let, let's get with him, council, in the next you know couple of weeks and, and work with him on that, because at the end of the day, all we want to do is be transparent to everybody, give everybody a shot to come up here and speak in front of us. That's the goal. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to leave that open. Okay, so so everybody knows um, 308, uh, 310, and 311 so far are, are staying open. All right. When is 311 staying open until? Oh, okay. Um, who wants to... to um, I, I simply suggested to the 21st, but if we feel we need more time, we can take more time. I think, I mean, I, 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 think I mentioned. Need, I, I think we need to take as enough time as we can yeah. to, get, to get this right. Yeah, I think we need to, so, the meeting you know, in January, please. If we got a lot going on in January, we can push this to February, because this is very important. We can do it the 14th of January, like the other one. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Give, give us enough time? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's do that. Okay. We good on that? You want to you want to read that back, to Madam Secretary, so everybody's got it in their head. Yes, resolution number three eleven mm -hmm. will remain open until the fourteenth of January. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Okay, so let's go to um, one more, which would be uh, three twelve. Resolution number 312, a resolution to adopt a redistricting plan for Board of Education election districts pursuant to section 312A01 of the Education Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, and open the, uh, open the uh, public hearing on this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start on this side. Does is, is anybody want to come here and comment on 312? 
Okay. How about, how about on my right hand side? Anybody in, in, want to come, come up and comment on 312? Okay. So, um, how's council feel about this one? Well, I'm ready to take it. Oh. This, uh, <laughs> this one, we actually okay. get through this one. All right, we're going so I'll make a motion. I'll okay. second it. Okay. <laughs> what, what's, the, what, right. what's the motion? Uh, that we accept the, the uh, resolution 312, the, uh, the, the new mapping for the, the district. Uh, the, the redistricting. So you're, you're moving yeah. it to vote? Yes. Okay, moving to, to vote. vote. Yeah, okay. right, we're just moving to vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we, got a, we got a motion. Who's the second? No, second. We haven't got one yet. We got a motion to second. I'll, I'll, I'll second and move the vote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Too late. Already did that. Okay. Right. We got a motion <laughs> to second. Make a difference to vote. Um, Madam Secretary. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Mr. Davilio. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Pat. Aye. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Madam Secretary, could call the roll. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Mr. Devilio, aye. Mr. Lesher, aye. Ms. Price, aye. Mr. Pat, aye. Okay. Mr. Callahan, yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. I, I just want to, I just want to reiterate my thanks to the members of the redistricting commission that we appointed for their quick and timely work in getting this done. They, of course, uh, were. Uh, we, we were somewhat late in in appointing them, uh, but the. Bureau of the Census was even later in providing them the necessary data for them to actually do their work. And they turned it around in a remarkably short time uh, with uh, able help from, uh, from our staff GIS department. So thanks both to the commission and to the staff for moving this along so that we could actually make the deadline for the Board of Elections to get uh, the redistricting done in time for uh, candidates to be aware and to file uh, for these offices uh, early next year. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right, Madam Secretary, let's move on to um, 1495. Can you read that record, please? Bill number 1495, a bill to amend section 19063 1A of the Talbot County Code in order to modify the composition of the Talbot County Short-Term short Rental Review Board. Okay, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I've had several people call me about this, so um, Mr. Thomas, could you shed some light on why we're at this point and we're going to make a few changes here? Yes, yeah, so the proposed amendment deletes uh, the requirement that the board have uh, an attorney with experience in real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that, I mean, that severely limits that that spot on the board mm -hmm. uh, and who can fill it and mm -hmm. that it's been difficult to get applications from somebody with that qualification because and they have to be in Paulding County, so there's just not mm -hmm. a very deep pool of candidates to draw from. Right. This doesn't preclude an attorney from serving on the board. I mean, it's still, right. it still has to be other persons having knowledge or interest relevant to the board's functions. It would just delete that as a requirement that it be one of the members be an attorney with experience in real estate. Right, right. So, um, counsel. It's public hearing, public right? Public hearing. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll wait to that. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to open it up. So um, here to my left, did anybody come over here and um, want to comment on 495? To my right, anybody would like to come up? Yes, yes, ma'am. Come on up. So, hello again. Yep. Um, I'm Monica Adi at 229 Madison in St. Michael's. And uh, I've actually watched most of the STR board meetings and I've seen the board has approved almost every application. And there were a few that were deferred or denied, but later approved after the issues that actually came up at the board meetings got resolved. But this is a very important process because this board review process of applications sets the ground rules and the expectations. And I think this leads to a better STR experience for everybody, for the owners, for the renters, and for the neighbors. And each board member has a different background, different experience, and this is really what, why we have good results from the board meetings. Um, I know that the Planning Commission reviewed 1495, 
and made a strong recommendation that the council keep the requirement that one STR board member be an attorney. And I strongly agree with this. Uh, attorneys are obligated as officers of the court and have training and experience to weigh the law, weigh the facts, and make appropriate decisions. Uh, the two previous STR attorney board members, Mr. Hall and Mr. Nelson, were extremely helpful at quickly zeroing in on issues that came up during the meetings or during the applicant's presentations and helping to resolve them. Uh, I do understand, as um, Mr. Thomas said, that no attorneys with real estate experience have applied. Um, I have to say, while during these meetings, I never heard either Mr. Hall or Mr. Nelson mention principles of real estate law, but they did focus squarely and help everyone focus squarely on the facts of each application and the specifics of the code. And I think this helped the board operate efficiently and make sound decisions. So I would say that instead of removing the attorney position entirely, please adopt the Planning Commission recommendation, remove the with real estate experience requirement, but keep the attorney requirement. And this would open up the pool the applicant pool to a broader group of people. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, anybody uh, on my right side want to come up and uh, talk about 1495? Okay, Let's open the floor to the uh, council. Well, Mr. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Callahan, I, I will make a, a, an amendment to the resolution, the bill as, as drafted. Uh, mm -hmm. I did hear from several members, well, I did hear from a member mm -hmm. of the STR board who mm -hmm. shared uh, Mrs. Adi's, uh, um, her uh, feelings. I, uh, I did. You did as well. Mm -hmm. and, I did too. Uh, and I, and of course, we, we all received mm -hmm. the Planning Commission's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. finding as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I do believe there is some basis to have someone there with some legal training on the STR board that can give them some guidance. Um, it, it appears from board members that I spoke with um, that that was very helpful to them uh, in some of their um, their discussions. So um, I would like to make the following amendment um, that uh, we strike out with experience in real estate and leave the board shall be composed of an attorney, comma, a representative from the vacation rental management industry, comma, a member of the community or civic association, et cetera, et cetera, as, as written in the, uh, in the bill. So I would just eliminate the words with experience in real estate and leave an attorney as my amendment. Okay, I'll, I'll second that motion to make that amendment. That's the way so we do that. Now, now that that's before us, uh, I, I would oppose that. We, we had a difficult time even hiring a, an attorney or getting applicants for the county office of law. Um, and I, I don't know if that's because attorneys are so busy due to all the hoops we put the community through. Um, but if, if we've had a difficult time finding an attorney with real estate background, now hearing that Kim Kardashian's passed the baby bar in California, I, no offense to attorneys in the room, but it, there's lots of different types of law that just will not, that yes, it will provide some experience in deliberating, but I don't quite see how that is going to transpire to approving an application that should be perfunctory. It, it, as we've heard, they are being passed. Every now and then we find a hiccup, we find something that, that might be wrong, it might be an older home, it might need some kind of changing, but that uh, it's this these are this is real estate we, we have real estate people on on the board um, and when it comes down to it, it it's just public use of, of private of private property so I don't I don't agree that we have to have an attorney on the board for it to be a, a strong board well I mean that was this was originally and I know I, I, I did I did second that just because we've we, you know we the people that we've heard from that's grand it's not a lot of people um, and we haven't been able to find anybody, so I'm not disagreeing with you either, you know, and I can, and I can pull the second. Um, 
I guess we should just have more. I was trying to get this to, to discussion with the rest well, of the council. We, we are at sure. discussion. We did have, uh, Mr. DeVille, I'm, I'm looking at in the last three months, three attorneys applied for this position that the council rejected because they were without the experience in real estate that the bill, that the current language uh, dictates. Um, had that language not been in place, um, I, my belief is that one of these three applicants would have been appointed. So uh, I think that language, uh, I, in my opinion, was a bit exclusive, uh, as we did have three qualified persons who were um, attorneys and who did apply that we could not unfortunately uh, appoint. So. Uh, you know, I, I was not prepared to support this legislation, uh, but given given this this amendment that Mr. Pack has proposed, which is uh, along the lines of, of the recommendation that comes to us from the Planning Commission, I, I could support this, and so I will support the amendment. Okay. Um, this is just one other comment that I wanted to make. There was a, there was a um, person who made a, a comment about residency and that we should um, consider people who are not full-time residents, meaning six months in a day. And I, I'd just like to say, I think that the rest of our boards and committees, we require that, don't we? I would have to check, but I, that's most likely. I mean, somebody that's just living here a couple months out of the year, I'm sorry, I couldn't support that for our boards and committees. And we've got some wonderful, you know, so many wonderful people in Talbot County who volunteer for all these boards and committees. Um, and I don't care how qualified you are, if you're not, if not, if you're not a full-time resident here, doesn't mean you have to live here more than six months in a day. But I think that that's, I think that's important. And so while I appreciate that comment, um, I think there's people, I think there's people out there who are, you know, really committed to, to being here in Talbot County. So I just, it, it was just, you know, someone that, um, I feel like that somebody needs to have, you know, full-time residency. And so they wanted clarification on these boards and committees. So I raise that so that, Mr. Thomas, you can go back and check that. And if it's not required, it's just something we need to think about. I, I can't um, think of anybody that's serving that's that's not, you know, at least a full-time resident. But I think that's important um, to continue to serve on our boards and committees. The For attendance, resident. emergency situations, especially if you're approving applications and something's appealed, absolutely. Yeah, I don't want someone that's just living here two months out of the year approving, especially this, especially this board. I mean, we would never do that for Planning Commission or Public Works Advisory Board, and I think this is probably, you know, this, this board is definitely up there. Yeah, I can certainly check on that. Thank you. you. Okay. All right, um, Madam Secretary, do you want to read back to what the amendment is, or is going to say? The amendment is to um, keep in, add back the words, and attorney, mm -hmm. and to delete or keep deleted mm -hmm. real estate experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With experience in real estate, so that part okay. is being removed. An attorney, okay. comma, representative from the vacation rental management mm -hmm. industry, comma, a member of the community or civic association for a community containing a short-term rental or rentals and other persons having knowledge or interest relevant to the board's functions. Okay. Okay, so at, the, at this time, Council, um, do you feel like you want to close um, the public hearing? Or, and, and do you feel like you want to vote on this? I make a motion to close public right. hearing and move to a vote. Okay. We're, we're, we're voting first on the amendment. On the amendment. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you get okay. the vote on the amendment. Yep. And again, this doesn't preclude an attorney with real estate experience. They can still apply. Love to have that, but it takes out okay. that full okay. restriction. Okay, Madam Secretary, we're going to be voting on it. Okay, we're going to vote on the amendment. Okay. Okay. Um, Madam Secretary, you're going to call the vote. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. Gavilio? Nay. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pat? Aye. Okay. All right. So, um, at, at this time, Council? Mm -hmm. Yeah, since, since the second. bill is not amended, and I don't yeah. know whether anyone from the Public will want to be heard on the amended bill that's now before us before you close public hearing. But well, I don't know because be, because of that, Mr. Pack, do you think we should keep it open? I do not. Okay. <laughs> but if anybody wanted to comment who's yeah. here now, they could. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. I'm here to my left. Would anybody like to, to comment? To my right. Okay. All right. Madam Secretary, could you please call the roll? 
Mr. Callahan. I'll, I'll take, I'll, so I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Yeah. Right, yeah. That, that uh, right, we need to. Third reader. Move right. it to, oh, third reader, I'm sorry, that's right. We need. This is a bill. That's been moved that's to third right. reader. Whoops. Before we vote on it. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Bill number 1495, a bill to amend section. After so much, we consider reading another bill, Mr. Callahan. With no objection. Right. Okay. Matters now before you for vote, Mr. Callahan. Okay. okay. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Mr. DeVilio. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Pat. Aye. Okay. Bill passes. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's everything. Next, next on the agenda is presentation and discussion of the potential uh, alternative location of the talk. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, President Callahan, members of the council, I'm Stephen Hunter, and this is my friend Ken Eaton. We've been in front of you before, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight. Ken and I are here to review the two properties that we have brought to the table for the relocation of the Talbot Boys Monument. In addition to those two properties, we are going to review the Virginia location that three members of this council voted to move the monument to. The bottom line is that we are going to show you that the monument, without a doubt, should remain in Talbot County, Maryland. Before we get to the presentation of the properties, we want to make sure we communicate very clearly with the public. We want everyone to come away from tonight with a complete understanding of what is exactly at stake for Talbot County and our citizens as a result as what, uh, of what has taken place up until now. And so that everyone is aware, we have found that there was never an extensive search for properties here in the county by our elected officials. That did not happen. The first thing to note is the council did not just vote to move the Talbot Boys Monument. Your vote included more than that, and I don't think the public understands that. The agreement that Mr. Davilio created with the Shenandoah Battlefields Foundation not only places the monument in the state of Virginia, the agreement turns over ownership of our Talbot Boys Monument to them. This council is giving it away. It will be given to an entity in the state of Virginia several hours away it will never be a part of our Talbot County history ever again because it will be totally out of, excuse please, me, please, sir. Please be quiet. Thank you. It will be given to an entity in the state of Virginia several hours away. It will never again be a part of our Talbot County history because it will be totally out of context. Context, as Mr. Lesher can attest to, is something that is very important to all historians around the world. When you take pieces of history away from their origin, they become worthless. This is a monument that was bought and paid for by Talbot County citizens more than 100 years ago to honor their fellow war veterans. It was placed there in honor, not as a racist symbol. If this council follows through on your actions taken so far, ownership of this monument will transfer to an entity that has zero, absolutely no interest whatsoever in Talbot County, Maryland. No interest in Easton, no interest in the state of Maryland. The foundation is in Virginia and is doing absolutely nothing for us in this room today tomorrow or when any of us are dead and gone. 
the Talbot boys will forever serve the taxpayers of Virginia. That is until someone else comes along and says, that monument shouldn't be there, get rid of it. Maybe we should melt it down for a fundraiser. If you don't believe that can happen, guess what, boys and girls, it can happen. We also want to make sure very clear that, we are in, that there are indeed more properties offered in Talbot County than the one here in Talbot County that we are discussing tonight. Yes, there are indeed more properties in Talbot County. But placing the Talbot boys on Route 50 on the south side of the county isn't an option that will please everyone. I can already see the picket lines now saying, don't put it there, it's not appropriate. Putting it in Cordova on the east side of the county would get the same exact reaction. Move the Talbot boys. We also have a property that's been offered to us right here on South Washington Street in Easton. But the problem with all of these is that the Talbot Boys Monument would still be in the public view. The goal of Move the Monument was not just to get the monument removed from the courthouse lawn. It has now become Get It Out of Talbot County, which is very unfortunate. Hence, they are raising funds to support the move to Virginia. None of them are making efforts to keep the monument here in Talbot County. Not one of them. The two properties we have brought to the table have been vetted with the interest of all Talbot County citizens in mind. Once you hear about the properties, I am confident that you will see that we have brought two much better options to the table than the state of Virginia. Much better options to honor the 84 Civil War veterans listed on the Talbot Boys Monument. Ken and I want to walk away from tonight after having productive dialogue and coming to a better resolution. So I will turn it over to Ken and let him talk about the properties and then we will have a wrap up at the end and hope to have a discussion with all of you. Thank you. Did you want us to run this slide, Jeff? Okay, uh, okay. that's all right. You, you want to run the... I'm going to let you do that. If you'll get us started, that would be great. Okay, great. Mr. E, could you, could you have... Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll get it here in just a second. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Ken Eaton from Queen Anne, Maryland. Uh, as Stephen said, we will discuss three different locations to be reviewed tonight. Other properties have been offered, but for various reasons have been omitted. All three locations being presented tonight are privately owned properties. The first one is Cross Keys Battlefield, and it is in, we can leave it right here for now. Um, Cross Keys Battlefield, and it's in Rockingham County, Virginia. The second is called Confederate Memorial Park, and it's near Point Lookout in St. Mary's County, Maryland. The third is the Shanahan property, near Trap, right here in Talba County. Let's start with Cross Keys. As I said, the location is in Rockingham County, Virginia, on private property, approximately 215 miles away from the center of Easton. Go to the next slide. The Cross Keys Battlefield is primarily owned by separate individual property owners. Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation owns approximately 170 acres of the estimated 4,498 acres of the battlefield. They have seven separate, mostly non-adjacent parcels that they own. Based on their own website, approximately 90% of the acreage of the Cross Keys Battlefield is not protected. They're in danger of development pressure. No plans have been presented showing where the monument would actually be located, and I think Stephen might want to say a little bit here about that. Yeah, I uh, sent an email into the county manager's office I copied the president of the council asking if there are any plans as to what they are going to do with the monument when it gets there. 
I got no response. I called Mr. Callahan on the phone and he gladly took my call. And he told me he is not aware of any plans. He has not seen any plans as well. I don't know if any of you have been there to visit this site, have you? Have any of you been to this site in Virginia? No, but I know we do have plans and markers and a map of where it's going. And I don't know why you weren't provided with that. It we were not. It was provided to us, I guess, on Friday. I think Friday. I don't know what day it was uploaded. But that's okay. We, we were not, but that's okay. Um, but none of you have been there to visit. You've not been to the actual property itself. Well, if you have not been there to visit, which you say you haven't, I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but there is nothing there. What you see on that screen is what's there. It's a bunch of fields with a few markers here and there to mark a few things, but it's fields. It's not like you're going to Gettysburg. It's not like you're going to the Smithsonian Institute. There's nothing there. My brother and his wife live down there. I've been there. There's nothing there, boys and girls, nothing. So with all due respect, it sounds good on paper, and as a marketing guy, they've got a great looking website, they've got a beautiful logo, they've got beautiful stationery. But at the end of the day, when it comes to this property, it's not a whole lot. It's not the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. It's not. So I just want everybody to be aware of that, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ken. The SVBF letters appear to be indicating an artillery ridge location. If that's the case, that's currently an open field on an 11.9 acre parcel owned by them. The SVBF is a private corporation registered in Virginia and is a 501c3 charity. There is an informational sign along a private road. Basically, you would drive approximately 1,000 feet off the public road to a small parking area follow a wood chip trail with no handicap accessibility and walk another 500 feet or so to what may be a monument location in the middle of a field. No electricity, no gates, no security, no lighting, no visibility from the public road. Also on the SVBF website, they indicate that residential, commercial, and industrial development pressures and future expansion of I-81 continue to threaten the battlefields in the area. And interestingly enough, the state of Virginia itself appears to be leading the country in removing Confederate symbols and monuments. There is an existing monument, a Confederate monument nearby, the Turner Ashby Monument. It is privately owned by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and it's near Harrisonburg. It was vandalized at least three times in a one year period in the 2020 timeframe. A third letter from the SVBF that is undated indicates that Councilman Frank DeVilio made it very clear that the monument is coming down and that it will not be erected in Talbot County. In addition, it states that it will be rededicated as the Maryland Monument and will commemorate the actions of all Maryland troops who fought in that engagement. Although that sounds elegant, it seems to be saying that the Talbot boys will no longer be the focus of this monument and will be repurposed to be a generic Maryland monument. Let's face it, there's already Maryland Union and Confederate monuments in Gettysburg and that's only 119 miles away. Previous letters from the SVBF indicate that their preference would be for the Talbot boys to remain in place or at least in Talbot County. They actually requested that if removed, an attempt be made to re-erect the monument in Talbot County. And along those lines, there were three letters sent by the Battlefields Association, Foundation, excuse me, directly to Mr. DeVilio, not to this council, not to Talbot County, Maryland, but to Mr. DeVilio only. The last letter that we received in our packet that, that the uh, county manager's office provided us with is undated, but it's easy to figure out that it's the third in a series of letter just by the language used in the letter. Why it was undated, I'm not sure, but organizations like this don't normally send out undated letters, especially with something that's as testy as this issue. 
The letter states, Mr. Davilio, I greatly appreciate your call to talk through the current situation regarding the Talbot Boys Monument. You made it very clear that the monument is coming down and that it will not be re-erected in Talbot County. The Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation has been very concerned that our willingness to accept the monument was used to encourage its removal. You have assured us that this is not the case and that the decision for removal was the result of years of debate. It goes on, but while at the end it just says, while we are saddened that the monument is being removed from its original location and further disappointed that it will not be placed in Talbot County, we understand that for the safety of the monument itself and to have the best hope of perpetual care and public enjoyment, moving it to the valley is a viable option. That is putting the cart way before the horse because this body did not do its due diligence to do what myself, Ken, and a few others that we have had help from have done, and that's how we got here tonight. Our, uh, our next uh, property that we're going to uh, bring to the table is Confederate Memorial Park in Southern Maryland. Uh, it is the Confederate Memorial Park located in Maryland, approximately 120 miles from the center of Easton. It is on Point Lookout Road in Scotland, Maryland. This park is a very interesting property that has been overlooked. Concerned individuals with the common interest of remembering war veterans that served in the Civil War sought out property, purchased parcels, and began a multi-phased plan for development as a memorial park. They became incorporated in Maryland, set up as a 501c3, and began to work. The seven-acre park is centrally located between the Point Lookout State Park, the site of Confederate Prisoner of War Camp Hoffman, and the United States National Cemetery, the Point Lookout Veterans Cemetery. As I said, it's owned by the Confederate Memorial Park Incorporated, and they are a registered Maryland corporation, and they're a 501c3 registered for charitable and educational organization purposes. Since its inception, the park continues to be improved with parking area, walkways, memorial bricks, historical displays, and an informational center. The Confederate Memorial Park holds various programs, artillery displays, and camp reenactments throughout the year. Recently, a sizable, con <coughs> excuse me, sizable Confederate grave marker recognizing 17 unknown Confederates killed at Fort Stevens was relocated here after it was vandalized several times at its former location. This site is immediately adjacent to a United States of America National Cemetery Administration owned parcel. That is the Point Lookout Veterans Cemetery with a very large Confederate monument. That monument includes 12 bronze tablets inscribed with the names and command of 3,382 known Confederate soldiers and sailors and 44 civilians that were buried in a common mass grave site. The Confederate Memorial Park currently has 14 security cameras that provide surveillance. Local law enforcement regularly patrols the area and due to its proximity to the U.S. Veterans Administration Cemetery located approximately 75 yards north, the U.S. Veterans Administration security officers are observed in the area quite frequently. The site has signage, a flag line, memorials, brick paver walkway, and parking immediately available off the public road. The potential monument location is within a short walking distance of the parking area, brick paver walkway, and the flag line. A few quick observations about what Ken just told you about. It demonstrates that this property is radically different than the one that is in Virginia. And yes, I believe that it was overlooked it has great security. As you can see by what is on the screen, there is a lot more happening in Southern Maryland when it comes to Confederate Memorial Park. If you were to visit this location in Southern Maryland a couple of hours away, you would obviously find that it's pretty nice. It's why St. Mary's County even uses it on their own website for tourism. It's totally different than the Virginia property. By the way, if you were to do your homework on Rockingham County, Virginia, 
you will find absolutely no mention of Cross Keys Battlefield whatsoever in anything in their county. There's no draw for tourism. There's nothing. It's not a jewel in their crown. It's not Gettysburg. It's nowhere. It's non-existence. It's non-existent. The only way you find it is if you are aware of the Shenandoah Valley Battles Foundation, Battlefield Foundation. And what's even better about this particular location is we have a direct contact, a direct tie to the Talbot Boys. One of the Goldsboro's was in the Confederate prison there and got out. And I'll let Ken expand on, on who Mr. Goldsboro was and, and what he did in our county. Lieutenant Robert H. Goldsboro, state delegate and state senator, descendant of Governor Charles Goldsboro, the 16th governor of Maryland, started in the Captain William H. Chapman's company of the Virginia Light Artillery, went on to Captain William J. Pegram's battery, and then to Company B, the 39th Battalion of the Virginia Cavalry. He was the escort and bodyguard to General Richard S. Yule and aide-de-camp to General Jeb Stewart. He was captured by federal troops in 1863, sent to be a prisoner of war at Old Capitol Prison in Washington, D.C., transferred to Johnson's Island Prison Camp in Ohio, and lastly was transferred to Point Lookout Prisoner of War Camp. He was later released and fought in various other battles, was mortally wounded at the Battle of Sailors Creek in Farmville, Virginia, and is buried at Ashby, the family cemetery located on a privately owned property right here in Talbot County. So again, there's a direct tie to the Talbot boys. It's real, and there is his name that's on the side of the Talbot, Talbot Boys Monument. And with that, we'll uh, move ahead to the Shanahan property right here in Talbot County. The Shanahan <coughs> property is located on Caloris Point Road near Trap and is a mere 19 miles from the center of Easton. Do you want to talk about the article? Yes, I'll uh, show you something interesting that we found in this whole process. It's an article that was in our local newspaper nearly 50 years ago. Um, so before we talk about the property, this was given to us by someone else who contacted us that is in support of keeping our monument in Talbot County. What happened is 50 years ago, there appears to have been a few questions raised in the Star Democrat about the origin of the Talbot Boys Monument. And I say this because people like Mr. Pack, who have been through umpteen hearings over the years on this, you probably know it inside and out. Nobody else is aware of these things. They've been thrown to the side. They had an article that was asking, how did this thing appear? Who did it? Why is it here? They ran the article, and a gentleman by the name of T. Earl Ewing, who was born here in the late 1800s, he was 85 at the time that he responded to this article, contacted the Star Democrat to clear up the details. It's in that article that we found that Mr. John H.K. Shanahan was on the committee that brought about the idea of the monument in 1913. So he is one of the very few people who were responsible for placing the base out in front of the courthouse in 1914. And Mr. Shanahan died less than a month before the statue of the boy was added to the base. So not only does this have a great tie into Talbot County, it has a direct tie to the monument, the man that's on it, and why it's here in the first place. So I'll give the mic back to Ken. We get back <clears throat> to the actual property. The property is owned by William Elston Shanahan III, who is a descendant of Talbot boy John Henry Kelly Shanahan and has other blood relatives by the name of Valiant and Dawson on the Talbot boys monument. This property has been in the family for the past 185 years. The monument would be placed near an existing barn to allow the owners to maintain a level of security. Electric is available for lighting. There is an existing private roadway that serves this area of the farm, separate from the private residence. 
The placement will be near an existing private road near the barn overlooking a farm pond. The area would be improved with a small parking area and courtyard for special events and visitation. At the end of the day, while we have three properties in front of us, two of them are much stronger than the first one that was presented to you. We strongly feel that at the end of the day, there is no better place for the Talbot Boys Monument than Talbot County, Maryland, for too many reasons to count. The Shanahan Farm has been in that family since 1836, as Ken mentioned, 185 years. They are a direct tie to someone on that monument. They are a direct tie to someone who is responsible for placing that monument here. For those who do not know, John H.K. Shanahan was much more than just a member of that committee who came up with this idea. He was a prominent citizen of Talbot County who employed a lot of people here. After the Civil War, he started what we know today as Shanahan Artesian Wells in St. Michael's. Yes, that business that's still there today, over 125 years old, was started by the man that's, whose name is on that statue. In addition, Mr. Shanahan constructed and put into operation the very first ice plant ever on the eastern shore of Maryland. Can you imagine living in a world without ice or thinking about how am I going to get ice? I mean... We can't relate to that in this room. We can't relate to that time period at all. I'd say at that point, you know, he's probably a local celebrity or hero when you're the guy who's responsible for helping getting ice to the tavern. He and his wife also raised a great family here in Talbot County. One of their sons was the editor and manager of the Eastern Star Democrat newspaper, which at the time was a major focal point of life when the newspaper was still a very big deal. And their other son was the assistant to the president of Maryland Steel Company in Sparrows Point, which was one of the more important Maryland businesses during its time. All of this means more, a lot more, to Talbot County than the Cross, Cross, uh, Cross Keys Battlefield in Virginia. The right thing to do is to work out the details with the Shanahans, have a work session, have a public work session, whatever needs to be done to keep that monument here. It is in the best interest of everyone in Talbot County. It is the best interest of the people who have the Battlefields Foundation. If you read the three letters, they have done everything but throw up their hands and say, we don't want it, find a place in Talbot County for it. And whether you choose to listen to them or not is solely up to you. And I appreciate what Ms. Price said a little while ago as you were discussing the right way to use administrative resolutions or what have you and standing up for the public and enabling the public to come before you and have open dialogue because that's the way government is supposed to work. It didn't happen in this particular instance. It just didn't. Why? I don't know, but I wish it didn't happen that way because we could have saved many steps in this whole process. You could have saved yourselves a lot of time in umpteen meetings. You spent 37 minutes in the last meeting arguing back and forth about us coming in here and all the things to go along with the Talbot boys. That's just one little tiny microcosm of what's happened in the past several months. Do we have any questions for any of us? Council, open it up. If you have questions, and then I've got a little wrap up afterwards, if you would please. Um, I'm prepared to hear the wrap up. Yep. Uh, I, I, might, I might have a question or two. Um, we've, uh, we've heard from the Move at the Monument Commission that has raised funds, uh, not only for the relocation, but for the, uh, the installation and the interpretive signage at Cross Keys. Um, if those funds are not available for the installation and interpretation at one of these alternate sites, uh, 
who would who would uh, fund those efforts? We will guarantee those. Those are funded. Thank you. Um, for the Shanahan Farm location, uh, what happens uh, if or when the uh, the farm is sold or inherited by somebody who no longer wishes to have this monument? That is an excellent question. First of all, agreements can be put into place to do just about anything that we want to do in life. To protect the ownership of the monument, to protect it going forward. As far as I'm concerned, this is my personal opinion, it should remain the property of Talbot County where it sits, is where it sits. It is still owned by Talbot County. We should not be giving this monument away to the state of Virginia, to a foundation in Virginia. That doesn't work for me. As a Talbot County citizen, to give it away and benefit taxpayers outside of this state, that just makes no sense whatsoever. When you have better options on the table. Again, my suggestion is to get with the Shanahan's, have a work session, everybody work through the details, and come up with the agreement that puts everything into place, that locks everything into place, that it's still the property of Talbot County. It happens to be sitting in a much better place and a memorial park that happens to be on the Shanahan property with a direct tie to the Talbot boys. This is a family that has contributed a lot to Talbot County in the last 200 years. There are more Shanahans than just these Shanahans, so I think that's easily worked around. It just takes effort. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and what kind, of, what kind of public access or interpretation would, might be available at the Shanahan Farm? Uh, there will be public access. That Those, again, the details of the public access have to be worked out with the Shanahans. But you said that there's a, uh, a separate road that is not part of the residence and that it would be, you know, they basically have a, a, a spot picked out where they would, mm -hmm. where they would do that. Yes. The, the picture that's on the screen is, is near where, where they would like to have it placed on the farm. There's a farm pond uh, between the barn and basically the river. You know, it would sit and have a courtyard for it. And so I, th I guess, Mr. Lesher, your question about uh, an agreement in place, I mean, they've had it for 185 years. I, you know, wouldn't think that they're going to be selling it to someone outside of the family. But if they were, you're saying that we would work out an agreement that if they sold it, that needs to stay put. It's one of Talbot County's outstanding properties that we are very fortunate to have several of and have books this thick about. It's probably the case where, whether it's a fee simple lot or an easement or whatever, uh, something can be worked out to be placed on that so that Talbot County has some So a Talbot County over. easement, right? Is, is that farm still intact? Yes. As far as I know, um, there, there are some lots that were recorded some time ago on that lot, and there's actually a right-of-way that goes right down the road that goes to this, but the lots are past where the monument would be. Is it in a trust? Don't know the answer. To that. Uh, owned by the family, as far as I know. I think it's just William and his wife. I would have to check into that, to be honest with you. Okay, so they, they have intentions of selling all parts of it or at some point in time they did when they divided the lot? Um, you can't say they have intentions to sell it. I think what they've done is preserve the, the option that if they ran into financial problem that there are additional lots that they could sell. Does not include the lot which is where this would be placed. So the other, I mean, my strong feeling is yes so i'd like to keep it here in talbot county the other location of which you spoke is beautiful and um i think would be also be very well cared for um you know i think that's a excellent you know alternative if we can't get to an agreement with the shanahan's um to have that work out if we don't have enough you know council members but clearly um hearing about um the the Cross Keys battlefield site, and I did go back, and I don't know whether you can get them up on the screen or not. The, the, is that the photographs that are on our yes. laptop? Could you put those up? Because it does, um, doesn't look that exciting. Um, 
they do look like there's nothing out there. They have some schematics, and I'll wait for Ms. Morris to get them up on the screen. So there's four pictures here, and it does seem kind of as you described, that there's, I don't see any other, anything else there. So that doesn't seem to, you know, run, con what pictures we have doesn't seem to run contrary to what you say. And if we go a little further, then there's that map. So you haven't seen that, Mr. Hunter or Mr. Eaton. I, I've seen that map. It's, it's actually a map of the Battle of Cross Keys from 1862. But the property that's, that you see there is 90% privately owned. It's not owned by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation. They own very, they own seven parcels in Rockingham County that total to be 170 acres. They're not even adjacent to each other. So there's so a few that are. I don't see a live photo of anything. And you, and you won't, and you won't. There's nothing there. Uh, truthfully, uh, the, the fences that you saw that mm -hmm. are quite typical of Civil War battlefields, there's a, there's, it's Artillery Ridge, so there's a little bit of an elevation there. It's a field, there's a tree line, and there's a fence line. That, that's pretty much it. That's what's there. So, I mean, it doesn't even compare, you know, at least from my perspective, to seeing the other one in St. Mary's County. I mean, if, the, if those were the only two, I mean, it seems like, gosh, you've got a place that's already done, but, but again, if we can find a way to, to keep it here in the county, uh, we hope that we can do that. I, the POW camp that you, you would foresee putting the statue, no, memorializing I've, them at a POW camp where come, they're, between where the, the two. soldiers were held. There's, it's next to the POW, POW camp. cemetery and the Confederate Memorial Park is owned separately by a private corporation and they have installed walkways, memorials, I mean, did you flag see line. I mean, yeah, 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 it's a POW mm -hmm. camp. I, I just feel that if I was a soldier, I would appreciate being recognized more where I, during battle, than I would at a POW camp. And I, I, I have mentioned before, again, that I don't want to stick this in one individual's yard in Talbot County. Well, it's not, it's two, two things, a couple things. It's a gross misrepresentation to say that you're going to stick it in somebody's yard. It's a gross misrepresentation to stand before the council and, and the public and start talking about homeowners associations. We're not talking about any of that kind of stuff. We're talking about a place that makes more sense than anything any of us could come up with in a million years right here in Talbot County. So and to address the PO park. And to address the P may I finish, please? No, because you corrected Excuse me, me incorrectly. Sir, with all due respect, I had this conversation with Mr. Lesher yesterday where we were uh, talking about whether you know the, the ins and outs of 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 the Shanahan property and what's apropos and what's not. As far as what you're asking about whether it a POW camp, as you can see by the pictures on the screen, it's not a POW camp. It is an elaborate setup that even St. Mary's County is using for tourism. Rockingham County, Virginia is doing nothing with the fields that you just saw on that screen. Nothing. It is radically different. It is apples and oranges. There is zero comparison. There's just not. Uh, and I would agree with you on that. Well, let's, 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 um... Would you like to wrap it up, Chuck? I mean, do you tell me? Well, I, I'm going to say something. Thank you. Then you can wrap it up. I'm going to give Mr. Mr. Pack a few minutes to, if he wants to say something. So, so, the, so the whole goal in, in, the, in the years here was to remove the Talbot boys. So that, that's happening. So, so, so the goal would be is trying to find a place for it. So you guys have, have, have done your homework and, and, and brought to light um, two more places for us to consider. And, and I really appreciate that because both places are, are, are good places. And, 
and it's great discussion. It's what we should be doing because this is such an important um, moment for Talbot County. It's very important to a lot of people. Um, and one of the goals have been achieved. Okay, it's 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 moving off the courthouse. Um, I'm sort of thought about this proposal with, with the Shanahan's and stuff. Um, I, I sort of feel like, and I was talking to Mr. DeVillio today a little bit about it. Um, so the whole intent of the Talbot Boys 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, I should say, was the 50th anniversary, and, and these guys fought here. Um, I'm not quite on board with taking these, these soldiers to the place that they have nightmares at, and in in their, in, if they if they fought in these battlefields, that that's that's reoccurring, um, it's reoccurring to them in a place where um, they seen their buddies and family that fought together die. So when you when you look down at thirty thousand feet at this. These boys deserve to be here in Talbot County because the whole intent was to keep them here. Maybe it wasn't the intent at the beginning to put them on the courthouse. We all agree with that. Some do, some don't. But the intentions were to keep that, that monument here in Talbot County, and those boys here. That, that was the intent. So I, I sort of feel like the Shanahan Farm is a, is a good solution and we work out the details of, of, of that because the whole intentions was to move that. That that that's that's and we and we're, we're past that. So the intentions are move it 15 miles down the road, work out the details, make sure these boys are safe for the rest of their life and everybody's life around here. Everybody that wants to see it can go see it. So you know, I, I think it I, I really appreciate the Shanahan's coming forward. Um, so do in, we. In, in, in offering their property because there that has been a you know a source of contention with people wanting to come forward to, to do that and, and I appreciate that. Um, so you know I think council should really give some hard thought and, and, and this is something I know we talked about we needed to vote on this tonight but once again We've, we've left everything open, you know, in a sense. We, we don't have to, we can vote on this, but at the end of the day, you brought a lot of information to us, um, and I'd like to be able to at least learn a little bit more about the details. If we can get the details right of the Shanahan family, that's where I'd like to see it. Well, and, and when the whole thing started, the move the monument people just said get it off the courthouse grounds i don't understand why everybody is so determined to get it out of the state i don't understand that it seems disingenuous to me that they started with just all we want is off the courthouse grounds and now you know they're funding it to get to virginia i don't understand that i don't understand why on this council that there's, this should be a 5-0 vote. This should be so easy to keep it right here. We can work out the details. If, there, if, if there's a, if this is what we want to do, we will get it worked out. It's an easement, something in, you know, it's been in their family for 185 years. If we want to ha make this happen, we can make this happen. And I think this should be a very easy vote. And if people wanted to go to Virginia, there's got to be some other reason it's got to go there. And I'm really um, surprised. I didn't think that the pictures of Cross Keys were what they are. Beautiful battlefield, nice fences. Nobody's going to go out there. It's just going to get lost out there. And that, that's a crime, in my opinion. So I don't know. I, I make a motion right now to um, try to work out everything, make a, a tentative vote here to go to the Shanahan farm, you know, spend a few weeks making sure we can work out all the details and go from there. And I'll second.
Any discussion? Any more discussion? Madam Secretary, could you call the vote? Mr. Callahan? Aye. Mr. DeVillio? Nay. Mr. Lusher? Nay. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Pat? No. Okay. So, is there a plan B? The other option? Do you want to wrap it up, guys? Yes, I will wrap it up. Okay. To refresh your memories a little bit, tell members of the public who may not be aware, Ken and I are the ones who came before you in June with a shovel-ready plan to add the Union Talbot Boys Monument to the courthouse lawn. That monument would have been the one that would have honored the Union side of what took place with Talbot County veterans. At the same time, it would have honored the hundreds of United States colored troops from Talbot County who fought for the Union side too. Unfortunately, that project will never see the light of day because that too, just like the vote that just took place there, ne it never came to be. I want everybody to be aware a few weeks ago, we filed a Maryland Public Information Act request with the county in anticipation of tonight. And we want the public to know what we found because it's important. We found the RFP and the newspaper ad for the RFP to move the monument. We found Ken's email to the council with a letter from the Confederate Memorial Park in St. Mary's County along with the Shanahan letter. We found the three letters from the Shenandoah Battlefields Foundation. All three were addressed directly to Mr. DeVilio. They were not addressed to the council. All of the letters were regarding discussions that he had directly with them. So it does appear to be true that Mr. DeVilio was the sole decision maker in moving the monument to Virginia and then Mr. Pack and Mr. Lesher supported him just like they did tonight. How that can be is beyond me because that is a gross, gross abuse of political power within our county, which is something that was addressed earlier in this room. The most interesting thing we found was a letter from the council to Mr. Paul Prager at Blue Point Hospitality here in Easton dated July the 1st. That was right on the heels of the presentation that we gave you on June the 22nd. It refers to a proposal that nobody in Talbot County has seen. And it's an important letter because it shines light on exactly what we're talking about here now. Dear Mr. Prager, thank you for your proposal with regards to the Talbot Boys statue. I appreciate the time you took to prepare the proposal and for your suggestions to appoint a committee to commission a new monument recognizing both the Union and Confederate veterans of the Civil War to relocate both the Talbot Boys statue and the Frederick Douglass statue, possibly to the Talbot County Historical Society, and your willingness to fund an additional staff member at the Historical Society, as well as an exhibit on the history of the statues in the context of Talbot County's history. Council members are taking the time to listen to the community, read emails and letters on this matter, and review various proposals as they are being presented your proposal will be given consideration. In the meantime, should you wish to discuss it further, please do not hesitate to contact me. Your dedication and commitment to the Talbot, to Talbot, County, Talbot County's community is recognized and appreciated. Sincerely, County Council of Talbot County, Chuck Callahan, President. And uh, let's see here. So there you go. You have somebody else in the community that was ready, willing, and able to contribute and be a part of a great solution and nothing happened. And here we are today still addressing an issue that had no public input whatsoever. And Mr. Davilio, if you feel good about that at night, you're in the wrong profession, period. You should not be serving in government. Yesterday, Ken and I met with Mr. Lesher over coffee. In part of our conversation, we talked about the need for a change in the tone of government and our society, just like is being reflected here right now. People need to start talking again. Near the end of our coffee meeting, I asked Mr. Lesher, what can people like Ken and I do to help you on your side of this? What can we be do better for this process? And that meeting ended with Mr. Lesher saying, doing just what we're doing right now, meeting over coffee, 
working over the details, airing things out, and getting to the bottom line. That never happened with this issue, thanks to you. Have a good night. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, let's move on to uh, public comments. Do we have a list? The, uh, the list that was, oh, we've got additional. Uh, we have uh, just one on the list uh, signed up in advance, and that is uh, Sherry Wilcoxon. Sherry Wilcoxon, Waverly Road, Easton, Maryland. I'm absolutely stunned. I don't, even, I don't even know what to say. It was so apparent there were two better locations. You got your way. But what, I, I just have to sit here and say, what's the driving force but behind the, cross, uh, the Shenandoah Valley? There's something that doesn't make sense, doesn't add up. And it's very suspect. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that you can say a judge um, validated what was done here that night with the administrative resolution, but we know judges are wrong all the time. And if it was right, then why are you changing the rules? Why does 311 need to happen? So something stinks, like I said before, with this whole thing. As a historian, Mr. Lesher, I'm stunned. I'm stunned that you would be let it go out to nothing. Council As a historian, yeah. it's a, it's they, a shame. They're not supposed to be directed to individuals. They, you know, could you not direct them? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, as any historian seems like they would not want um, any kind of a statue to go, no, in, um, go somewhere where would it not be preserved or protected. Mm -hmm. The Shanahans have had that property 25 years before the Civil War. Um, there's no, it's all private property. And, and when a highway comes through Shenandoah, then what? So it's, it's unbelievable to me that, that this is what y'all would do and the vote that you would take. And, and there seems to be no reprisal. There seems to be no penalties for not following your own charter, none. And, and, and if it was right, then why are you changing the rules now? If what you did was right, why is there a need to change the rules? So I, I, I just, I don't even know what to say. I can't believe how disappointed I am in the three of you for voting to not give us an option to stay here in Talbot County. What difference does it make to you? You, didn't, you don't care about it. What difference does it make? By the way, Virginia just voted to burn Robert E. Lee's statue, melt it down. Did you know that? It's in the news and all over the place. They're going to melt it down and make art out of it. So Virginia is not a safe place for this statue. But for y'all, that's OK. That's OK. Um, I don't know. Lies by omission, the letter that Prager wrote, I mean, that, that the proposal Prager wrote, we were told that there was no other options. Obviously, there was an option. And, and, and it was a written proposal with a great deal of detail. That was never mentioned. The red herring of a you know, homeowners association brought up at the last meeting, that, that was basically a lie by omission because it wasn't true. It's just like talking about putting it in New York City. That was never what was up, what was up for consideration. It was just a red herring and a way to, to defraud this, uh, the citizens of Talbot County. 30 seconds. I'm sorry? 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't really have much else to say. The disappointment is, is remarkable, and I think um, there should be a lot of shame on multiple people on this county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilcoxon. Uh, that's the only name we have signed up in advance. Okay. okay. Mr. Ewing? Good evening, Council. My name is Clive Ewing, and I'll be representing Preserve Talbot History tonight. So I'd like to request five minutes, if that's all right. Okay, I live here in Talbot County. Regarding the pending relocation of the Talbot Boys Monument, I'd like to review the options available to the Council, notwithstanding the vote tonight. You heard, two, you heard tonight two wonderful options for the monument, both supported by Preserve Talbot History. The Shanahan property, exceptional private property owned by the Shanahan family since prior to the Civil War and currently owned by a descendant of one of the men honored on the monument. We could not imagine a better alternative location for the monument. Point Lookout, private property controlled by the Confederate Memorial Park. It's another beautiful property situated near a, a site significant 
to Maryland's involvement in the Civil War. It is our opinion both locations are viable and safe for the Talbot Boys Monument. Of course, the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation has offered a place in Virginia, and while this location has significant Civil War history, it barely scratches the surface for the men from Talbot County who fought during the Civil War both land, on land and sea. Hundreds of members of our organization looked at the Virginia site and found that it, was, it, it did not compare to the Shanahan or the Point Lookout locations, not a single one. Okay. While we believe the rightful and optimum location is to remain on the courthouse green, a secondary location certainly must be within the county's borders, if at all possible, but certainly not outside the state of Maryland. The Talbot Boys was never, was never intended to be a battlefield monument. It was intended to show a soldier returning home, flag in a position of surrender. It was to recognize locally those who had fought for what they believed and for some that had made the ultimate sacrifice. To emphasize one of the points that Mr. Eaton and Mr. Hunter made earlier tonight, I'd like to discuss one of the parameters in the decision-making process, which is the actual or implied ownership of this monument. And, and we might believe that the county owns a monument, and ultimately perhaps a judge will def define that. But it's our understanding that the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation has requested a deed of gift to transfer ownership from the county to the foundation. However, to our knowledge, Talbot County has never received legal transfer of the ownership of the monument from the committee that placed the monument originally. Every indication of the records from 1913 indicate that the monument was bought and paid for with private contributions to a committee composed of Civil War veterans, including members of the Confederate Veterans Association like Colonel Oswald Tillman. Tillman. As early as January 4, 1913, it's reported that Joseph Zeth and Oswald Tillman and other men were forming a committee to erect the monument. The Star Democrat indicated in July of 1913 that contributions were being kept by a private citizen, Henry Holliday, cashier at the Easton National Bank. In other words, these were not tax dollars. In June 1916 edition of the Cambridge Daily Banner, the article is explicit in stating that the monument will be turned over to the that the monument will be turned over to the Daughters of the Confederacy. In July 1973, the Star Democrat reported that the Talbot County Board of Commissioners had simply granted permission for that committee to place the monument on the courthouse grounds in 1914. There is no reference that the county accepted this as a gift or there was any transfer of ownership. With that said, we would hope that the council would provide particular deference to those that might have a legitimate vested interest in the monument, particularly those families who are descendants of the folks who contributed to the monument, as well as to the descendants of the men who are actually listed on the side of the monument. In totality, uh, notwithstanding the vote tonight, you would have been assured that the monument, if located at the Shanahan property or at Point Lookout, would have received the care and treatment it deserves by the people who have the most compelling personal interest in its perpetual survival. We notified the, the Shenandoah Valley in September that the monument ownership may be an issue. 30 we, seconds. We notify the council tonight that it remains so. We believe any effort on the part of the county to fabricate from thin air a deed is not based on the historical record and may be legally questionable. Therefore, we make three requests tonight. The, the county council consider what Mr. Eaton and Mr. Hunter presented again and select one of these locations for the monument. If the county decides to continue to pursue to reassign the ownership of this monument, we ask the county to perform some due diligence to show that it has free and clear ownership to the monument and share those details with the public before you sign that monument away. I don't know who's signing that deed, if it's you, Mr. Callahan, but I, we would expect some due diligence and share that information with the public so Sorry, that we Mr. could Ewing. determine how to proceed. And finally, Sorry. and finally, the last piece of this, if, if it's got to go and it gets disassembled, that in that monument is a bronze box with all the folks that contributed to that monument. And I don't think that bronze box with all those names needs to go to Shenandoah Valley. That 
is a property of, the, of, the, of this county and of the people that contributed and needs to remain here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Anybody on this side over here, on my left side here, want to come up and talk? Anybody on the right hand side would like to come up and talk? Yes, yes, sir. Come on up. Good evening. I'm Mickey Tyrone from Oxford, 200 Third Street. Um, in reference to the conversation, uh, the, the presentation by the gentleman about the Cross Keys and, and uh, uh, St. Mary's Memorial Park, I, I've been to St. Mary's Memorial Park and, and to Point Lookout many times uh, with my interest and in my involvement with St. Mary's College. It's a, it's a dignified place. On the other hand, the issue is that if the due diligence was done by the gentleman, they would have had an offer. Uh, we don't know that they have any interest at all. Do we have it? a letter from them offering to take it. So oh, yes, we do. Okay, well, that, that, would be, that would be interesting. On the other hand, uh, there would be some specific, you know, p point or where position where it would be, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing. Uh, with respect to the Shanahan family, uh, I, I know their name. I've only lived here for seven years, but I know their name. If you do the history, you know the, you know the name. And uh, I appreciate that. I, I also know that they've had the opportunity for quite some time now to make a specific offer and to, to do, again, the due diligence to answer the questions in advance and not begin to negotiate, you know, to take the, 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 the statue to that property. It may or may not be a great idea, but now's not the time to be beginning to negotiate. Now is the time to make the final decision. Uh, the, the issue of cross keys is another, is another issue. You know, in Virginia, from what I understand, for Virginia and also Maryland, uh, it's very specific. Uh, you know, when you have a battle there uh, where men died and uh, about a thousand men were killed, wounded, and missing at the Battle of Cross Keys, they take uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, honor uh, of, of how they handle their, their, uh, uh, their uh, battlefields. They treat the battlefields with, with a lot of dignity. There may not be a lot of uh, foo-for-all, you know, all around, you know, with every single battlefield. But on the other hand, uh, they are uh, very uh, uh, honorific about the way they handle uh, the, their events, especially with the Civil War. It's just the way it has been always in Virginia. And although they take uh, monuments down now in places like Richmond, et cetera, uh, and Charlottesville, that's uh, on a, as a result of some of the same reasons why we're thinking of taking it down here in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Easton. 30 seconds, Mike. The point is that, that uh, the, the statue is, is a misrepresentation of the actual history of the Civil War in this county. And it, it, it doesn't represent the true history. You know, we worry about losing sight of the 88, 84 men. We've lost sight of the, you know, 800 or so Union and black and, and, and white Union soldiers who have been forgotten for 100 years in this county. So the point is that uh, the, the decision making, the negotiating time is past. It's time to make the decision and finish the deal. And, and no place, no one place is perfect for the, for this, for the Talbot Boys Monument in perpetuity. You just do the best you can, and I think that the council has done a very good job, and you, and you deserve a lot of credit. It's been a tough, tough ordeal for you all. So let's make the decision and go with it. We'll do the best. We all do the best we can. Most importantly is that we have to define what happened in this county between it, it, in the lead up to the Civil War, the Civil War, and the aftermath, and define that. That has been missing for the last 150 years. And, and I think we absolutely have to work on what the history is. We have a good starting point with Dixon Preston's book, but we have to decide and, and, and settle upon what really happened here. Thank you very much. More to come. Thank you, Mr. Young. Yes, ma'am. Come on out. 
Hi, I'm Ridgely Ox from Bosman. I just want to say one thing quickly. It's been mentioned several times here that there's some sort of nefarious something or other going on. We've been raising money in good faith to move the monument to a place where we felt it would be treated with dignity and respect. That's it. There's no nefarious anything in the Move the Monument Coalition. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Well, let's get down to the end here. Okay. Um, Council comment. Uh, Pat. Hmm. I don't know what too much more I have to say tonight, Mr. Callahan. I hope everyone enjoyed the Thanksgiving yeah. and uh, kept it safe. And as we go into uh, another holiday, yeah. uh, when we're going to want to gather around family and friends. Uh, I want to continue promoting uh, vaccinations and boosters. Uh, as I told you all before, I received both of mine on the same day, something I would never do again. I won't recommend that anyone do. Uh, space those two shots out, but get both of them. Um, you know, we, we're, we're not out of this thing yet by a long stretch, so we must continue uh, promoting uh, vaccination, continue promoting testing, social distancing, and everything else that goes along with keeping ourselves and our family safe. Uh, look, we, we covered a lot of ground here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to go back and unpack all the stuff over again. Uh, just to say that, you know, with the changes that we're proposing uh, with the um, uh, procedure to the county rules of procedure, um, they're not changes to fix, well, they're also changes to, to, to hopefully um, make some of the procedural issues better, uh, let me put it that way. Uh, not that uh, we're trying to skirt around something or uh, do anything, someone said nefarious, or uh, correct something that we did wrong in the past. But we're trying to make sure that not just this council, but future councils have a better path of conducting the county business. And that's all. Um, and being able to clearly uh, differentiate between uh, an administrative resolution, a number of resolution, a bill, and how those handled, and what gives a public hearing, and what doesn't get a public hearing. Those are things that count, councils need to have clear rules and instructions to. Um, how we handle petitions, you know, and again, this council, this attorney, and the previous account, uh, attorney has heard me say this repeatedly, that we just need to clean up procedures of how we do things. Um, it's not to say that what we were doing in the past was technically wrong, it just uh, sometimes as you go through a bill, if you go through a procedure, you find that there's ways to do things a, a bit uh, a bit better. Uh, so I uh, just want to say that uh, I don't have anything really further more to say. Okay. All right. Thank you. This process that we've been through regarding the statue has been incredibly challenging. And the last thing I want to do is bring in another person who doesn't deserve it. And that happened tonight with Mr. Prager and the Talbot County Historical Society. I can't think of a worse location to put a Confederate monument than on the corner of Port and West Street. I, I can't think of a more offensive spot than that. So that's why when I spoke with him, I didn't follow through with it. And I let him know that I wouldn't bring him into that nor would I bring the Historical Society into it after speaking with them. The same goes for the cemeteries, the individuals, the churches, the family grave sites. This is an emotional issue that's very difficult for some people to handle. And the last thing I would do is make somebody go through it that doesn't want to be part of it. And that's my honor and integrity. Whether you like it or not, it's who I am. And that's how I have always acted and will continue to act. The reason I did it as an administrative resolution is because you saw it tonight. How many times have we had staff leave before comment because they're tired of hearing about it? How many applications have been withdrawn because of it? At the end of the day, we have government to run. 
And when people aren't applying and people are quitting and tech support doesn't want to provide the tech support anymore because they're tired of sitting through the public comment, I have to make a decision, which is what I did. And you're right, I didn't do public hearings. I had had several. I had heard everything that I thought I could possibly hear. And I don't think there were any surprises to any members of this council. And I spoke to them and I followed the rules of procedure. I did what was right. Whether you like the vote or not, whether you think the vote was right or not, I followed procedure correctly. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. The, 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 night, the night is going on. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I will put in a final word on this uh, monument as well. Uh, the, the, the decision at our last meeting, which we did not change tonight, puts the monument in the hands of a trustworthy custodian with a record of preservation, of public mm -hmm. access, and interpretation. Um, I do find it unfortunate that we did not have a viable publicly accessible site in Talbot County owned by an organization for its perpetual care to step forward and become the custodian of this monument. That's unfortunate. It didn't happen. Uh, I want to set the record as wearing my historian's hat uh, the straight on one oft repeated inaccuracy. The Talbot Boys statue, the young man depicted on it, is not coming home from war. His flag is not draped in surrender. Rather, this statue is quite, uh, the historical record shows, it is based, inspired by Longfellow's poem Excelsior, uh, in which the young man goes off to war and does not survive, or he goes off to his cause. He go, he, this, this statue shows a young man who is going off to war, off to fight a hopeless cause, and that meaning was not lost on those who chose that, that emblem, uh, the lost cause. Um, I will conclude uh, on a happier subject for all uh, with my congratulations uh, to Council Member uh, Laura Price on her election and inauguration as the president of the Maryland Association of Counties for this coming year. Uh, we had the pleasure of uh, seeing her uh, speak really eloquently before the crowd at MACO, very graciously, uh, as our new MACO president. Congratulations, President Price. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to rehash anything, you know, from tonight. I think we've, we've you know, we've said all that. Um, I want to give a thank you to our emergency services department. Um, Unfortunately, uh, I had to have them called on my behalf a week ago uh, last weekend and had an issue. And while I have always been incredibly supportive of the public safety here and I've had an opportunity to witness it and ridden in the ambulance with, you know, uh, with, my, uh, with my father and other situations, until you experience it for yourself, you really don't appreciate the knowledge and expertise and caring that they show. And yes, I was that bad patient, like no mother, you can't call them. Mm -hmm. And and then they get there, no, I'm refusing transport. And um, I was that I was that person. And you know, they you know were in, were insistent. They brought some equipment into the house, which they would normally keep out on the ambulance, to show me that I needed to go. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful, and that's a short story that, that, that I will share. One of the, one of the initiatives of, of MACO this year is about getting uh, reimbursement for transport, not only to places, I mean, for the hospital, but to other places, but for those times when uh, people refuse transport. Um, and I was like, oh, crap, this is, um, <laughs> this is one of those moments where um, I, re and I was having that conversation going, I know I shouldn't be refusing transport, but they took me and it got me good taken care of. But it was amazing to me, everything that they do in the ambulance itself before they ever leave the driveway. Um, and I will never forget that. And I'm incredibly grateful um, for the staff that, that we have. Um, 
and last, you know, and this was completely inconvenient because it was like three days before Mako, and I'm like, I, this this is not a good time, and you know, I got places to go and people to see, um, and it was um, the Maryland Association of Counties uh, conference was incredible. Um, while we had summer conference, the winter conference is different because we're all under one roof. We're not spread out all over Ocean City. And while the legislators weren't there because they were in special session last week taking, you know, taking some votes and whatnot, um, it actually, even though it's still hundreds and hundreds of people, it was more intimate because it really was just the locally elected officials um, you know, in the room together. And I, I am just so incredibly honored to have been working 11 years to get to this point and to be able to um, help lead this organization and bring people back together after not having really been together for nearly two years now. Um, and I'm going to take that very seriously because the reason that MAKO works and the reason that MAKO is so um, respected is because of the relationships that are formed. And I know I've talked about that a lot, but that was my message last, um, last Thursday night and will be my message throughout the upcoming year. And I just, I couldn't be more excited and honored to be able to be um, a part of that organization. I love it very much, and I thank you all for being there very much. Um, you know, had a lot of you know family and friends there, but um, everybody in this room, Mr. Pack, you had to leave um, Wednesday, but everybody else, you know, in this room, and staff and Cassandra and everybody, it just meant the world to me to look out at those tables and 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 see that that support um, and how we have all become have such great relationships and have become such good friends after all of these years serving together. So I thank you very much for the pleasure. Well, I'll wrap it up, Ms. Price. Um, you, you definitely knocked it out of the park with your speech. And um, it was a pleasure being there and supporting you. And um, congratulations. And uh, I know you'll do a good job this year And um, as president. And, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're blessed to have you as president because we're going to get all the up-to-dates really quick. <laughs> and, and we should, right? We should. So um, it, it, it's proud to have a president um, here in Talbot County, that's for sure. Um, last couple of nights, it's, it's been tough on staff, been tough on, um, on council, and um, you, you've all done a great job. You've done a great job. Everybody's done a good job. Um, I want to thank sincerely the public in the last couple of nights coming out um, and giving their views and trying to be transparent. We're doing the best we can to try to give you the information that we know um, and try to be transparent, being trustworthy. And tonight, I know we had some tough subjects. It's no, no use rehashing it, but um, we've done our best. And it's you that means a lot to us, and it's you that we work for. Okay? So we work for you guys. Um, staff, um, I really appreciate all the, the hard work you've done for the last couple of nights and a couple of weeks. You know, you're getting ready for Mako and did get ready for these meetings. So um, you guys have done a great, great job for us. And the public needs to understand how hard you guys work to get us the information, um, the best knowledge you can. Um, and there's information coming in every, every hour. So you're doing the best you can. So um, other than that, um, I appreciate everything that everybody's done for us. And um, Mr. Lesher, could you um, go ahead and um, wrap it up for us? The County Council's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 21st, beginning at 6 o'clock p.m. The Council will be convening an open session at 4.30 p.m. and immediately adjourning into closed session to discuss real estate, legal, and personnel matters as listed on the statement for closing that meeting. Therefore, uh, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Okay. So moved. Madam Secretary. Second. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Mr. DeVolio. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Pat. Aye.